Good afternoon and welcome to our fourth very special back to school live sunset safari. A special welcome to the kids of Rosemont Elementary School, just four to six years old, Kempsville Meadows Elementary School in the United States of America, the People's Primary School in Namibia. Lovely to have you guys with us here. Island Academics from the Bahamas, can you believe it? And Holy Trinity Primary in the United Kingdom. My name is James Hendry and it is very special to be with you here live from the western fringes of the Great Kruger National Park. We're going to be joined by friends of mine up at Madikwe Game Reserve, uh, up in the northwest, west of here in the Kruger Park and down in the Eastern Cape. We've started off our drive with some elephants, an elephant cow and an elephant calf and they are just digging a little bit in the sand there to see if they can find some fresh water. Please ask us as many questions as you would like to during the course of the drive. We'd love to hear from you. We want to answer all of your questions about Africa, about safari, about wildlife and any biological questions that you might have and maybe even questions about why it is that people become game rangers and how you become a game ranger. Send us any questions that you have. So what I'm doing with these elephants is I'm just letting them calmly get used to us being around and then I'm slowly going to move closer to them and hope that we can get a good view. <laughs> Diana, very, very valid question from the islands there. You want to know how elephants sleep. Well, they sleep by normally standing up if they're adults or lying down if they're very small. Big adult elephants struggle to lie down because the blood all pools in parts of their body and it's not very comfortable. But they will sometimes lie down. Okay, what I'm going to do is just drift slowly down this hill and we're going to see if we can't get a better view of these elephants. And I also know that somewhere around here there are some lions and I'm hoping we're going to find them too. So let's just slowly drift down here as slowly and silently as is possible in a big piece of machinery and we'll see if we can't get a better view oh yes I think we're going to get a nice view now nice-ish anyway there we go now these elephants are quite nervous you can see them moving away from us there I don't know why Normally they're pretty confiding, which means they don't mind being around us. But maybe, just maybe, they've seen those lions and the lions have made them feel uncomfortable. So we're going to look around here for the lions and see if we can't find them. It was three lionesses and five youngsters. If we're very lucky we'll f bump into them and be able to show them to you before you have to go back to whatever classes it is that you're going to have to go back to after you've been on your safari. All right, it's quite warm here. It's not very hot, but we're gonna go and have a look at all the weather in our different locations. And then you're gonna go off and meet another one of my friends out here in the bush. Yes, what a wonderful way to start this afternoon sunset safari. Of course, back to school as we are sitting here with a beautiful young female a leopard. And uh, she is way up in a tree and enjoying the beautiful breeze around here at a Juma Private Game Reserve in the world-renowned Sabi Sands, South Africa. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yes, uh, my name is Cedric Dahls. I'll be the naturalist here on Rusty. And behind the camera, we've got Muscles and Paw. So thank you for joining us. And wow, what a way to start a, uh, an afternoon. 
and um, yes as you can see a very tall tree very big uh, tree called a green thorn tree or known as a torchwood tree and we've got this leopard that is just taking a bit of an afternoon nap right on top I know that uh, James was with this uh, female leopard this morning and uh, she has got a kill um, uh, she's got a kill right in the fork you can't well, you can hardly see the kill now it looks like uh, I don't even see it anymore but I think she might have still something left there but she's definitely quite full panting quite a bit and having a good old cat nap but yeah perfect for a leopard it's nice for them just to be right up in this, these trees a nice vantage point nice area for her to take a look what's happening around here as well as quite a nice cool breeze that is way up in this uh, torchwood tree so wow 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 definitely i am so excited having a leopard on on screen this afternoon and especially this female and she's still young i mean she's only about a year and a half so that is still very young she's still pretty much in mom's territory so she's still a young girl Noah from Rosemont, uh, age seven. Good afternoon. Yes, of course, uh, this leopard has to hunt for itself. I mean, uh, you know, that's, uh, well, look, being a year and a uh, one and a half years old, um, she's starting to hunt like small antelope, like your daker, your steenbok, maybe uh, baby impalas, things like that, uh, scrub hares. So she'll try her luck with as many things as possible. But if her mother, her mother's name is Kashava, now if Kashava uh, kills something like a big impala, like that's a big antelope, and uh, she takes it up into a tree, of course, this young female, the daughter of Kashava, this of course Nsumi, she would of course take that opportunity and also have a bit of a bite from mom's kill. So yes, mom will still kind of, how can I say, um, assist her with, uh, with food. But now, you know, at this point in time, she's by herself. She's becoming independent. In other words, she's becoming a solitary girl, looking after herself. And uh, she's starting to, of course, do her own hunts and killing her own uh, prey species. So, yes, exactly like what's happened. Yeah, I think she's got a day cut. I think, uh, what was it this morning? I can't see the kill. A steenbok. Tiana from Island Academic, age nine. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the question. How do leopards climb a tree? Well, a leopard's got very sharp claws, very strong shoulders. And of course, once they have to climb a tree, they go, of course, with their first, uh, their front uh, legs or their front paws first, and then I'll grab hold of that tree with those sharp claws, and then they'll work themselves up to the top. And uh, you'll, if you find, if you actually look at a leopard's shoulders, it's very, very muscular, a lot of muscles there. And uh, a leopard is the strongest cat, pound for pound. So by the, for the size, they are the strongest cat because they can even take the kill up into a tree. And what's amazing about this is that they can carry twice their body weight up into a tree so a female leopard will get to about 35 40 kilograms and they can take a full grown uh, impala up right up into this tree so they are very powerful so they'll put the impala in their mouth and then they'll put it between the front legs and then they'll climb up the tree of course going uh, front uh, front legs first and they're very very powerful cats and then they'll get right to the top and even when they come down, they'll come down front first and then sometimes they'll work themselves slowly down and uh, eventually they will, pretty much halfway down this tree, she'll kind of take a little bit of a leap and gracefully land on the ground. So they're very agile cat, uh, cats, very, very agile cats. And if you look at uh, this beautiful female, Mtsumi, big thick tails. Rosemont Elementary. Do we ever feed the animals? No, this is all self-sustaining. So all the animals here, they hunt for themselves, they feed by themselves. We do not, uh, we do not ever, um, how can I say, um, um, play a part in any of their kind of food sources. This is everything self-sustaining because more we kind of get involved, the more we have to clean up and we don't want to do that. This is all pretty much natural and wild. So they do their own hunting, their own feeding, and we do not get into that. 
And of course, this beautiful female, I mean, it's just, she's doing, doing so well for herself. She's definitely been hunting quite a bit these days and catching quite a few things for herself. So she's definitely honed into her hunting skills and became quite a formidable hunter. But as I said, she's still in mom's territory, so mommy's still maybe around here somewhere. Quite a big territory. Mom's got maybe like a six, seven, eight square kilometer territory. So the mom is somewhere in this area. And um, of course, this young female, she does not have a territory of her own. But sure, yeah, she's got a definitely a nice little spot up here. Nice little area that she can actually rest. And also that big thick tail you can see that's hanging at the back, like hanging down a little bit. You see that little, little bit of tuft that's pretty much uh, waving in the wind there. And uh, you'll find leopard's tails are very thick. So when they do climb trees, it's a nice thing to use as a counterbalance um, object. But yeah, she's definitely almost now fast asleep. I think she doesn't want to look at us for now. We never know. Let's take a look. Back to School Week is now drawing to a close. Join James and Cedric for a fireside chat to take a look back at the highlights from a very special week. Sign up to be an explorer and you can join them as they take a look at how important it is to connect our future conservationists to the natural world. Wild Earth Kids, it's in your nature. I'm just checking around on the road here to see if I can find some tracks of the lions. Three lionesses, five youngsters. They came along this way and now they've disappeared, but we will try and find them as we go along and hopefully before the end of, your, of, of this safari drive. I just wanted to show you a nice piece of grass here. I'll bring it to the front so it's easy for Olaf the Viking who is on camera today. This rather beautiful piece of grass is called the saw toothed love grass and you see it's got saw teeth on it and it's called a love grass because inside those seeds there is a heart or inside these little flowers there's a heart shaped seed so that is the saw toothed love grass and beautiful colors subtle honey kind of yellow and a bit of purple and pink and red it's just beautiful okay let's carry on 
Zander, you're seven years old and you say, what is a safari? That's a really good question. A safari, Zander, is a journey. A journey is a, um, what was it? A journey in Swahili is what a safari is. So a safari is a Swahili word from East Africa meaning journey. Let us try and see if we can find these lions. I think we're off air. I no, we're not off air. We're still here. <laughs> Hello, Aubrey. You're wondering if I've ever seen animals fight. I have seen animals fight many times, Aubrey. Uh, what have I seen? What's the most spectacular fight I've seen? Probably a fight actually not between lions or buffalo or elephant, uh, but between nyala. And a nyala is a type of antelope. And I've seen nyalas have a horrible fight. But luckily, neither of them died, but they did hurt each other quite badly. And they're nyala with big horns and they look like two sword fighters clicking against each other parrying and thrusting and it was an amazing thing to see and i'm very glad that neither of them managed to hurt the other one too badly so that was probably the most spectacular fight i've seen hippos fight a lot elephants fight quite a lot buffalo fight quite a lot lions don't fight too much except when they're trying to kill something and in fact when they're very hungry and they think that somebody's going to steal their food, then they like to have a fight. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the ground and I'm hoping that I'm going to see some footprints from these lions. They were in here this morning and they will normally not go far on a warm day like today. But sometimes they do what we don't expect them to and they just disappear. So we have to watch for the ground and they could be in the deep shade and most likely be in the very deep shade. All right, let's go up to Madikwe Game Reserve up in the far northwest province of South Africa where Stivovo, my good friend, is waiting to say hello to you. Well, good afternoon, kids. Welcome to Medikwe in a completely different part of South Africa to where James and Cedric are. And well, we have found, can you guess? They have some stripes and there's a little baby in the grass there that mum is giving a little lick. Oh, very cute. We've got some zebras here in the savannas of Medikwe. It's a warm day and they are looking for some shade. And it's a warm day of course and I am out and about and my name is Steve, otherwise known as Steve Wolvo, as James said. I'm joined by Rion on camera and we are very excited, boys and girls, kids, to have you with us today out on this sunset safari in the African wilderness. Now, over there is the striped horse, the zebra. And it's very nice to see zebras with babies. Very nice to see that she's got her baby in the shade. She's giving it a bit of a grooming. She's also a little bit of shade as well for the zebra. Hello Charlie, age nine from Ireland Academics. You want to know how zebras form herds. Well, starts off with a male, also known as a stallion. Gets to about five, six years of age, and he's then old enough and strong enough to compete for females. He will then go and acquire a female from another herd, generally the daughter of another stallion, 
but he will fight for the right to that lady and the stallion who is there already will be quite physical with him he won't be letting his daughter go off to just any old chap and so that is how the first part of the herd starts and obviously then they will have babies and he will do that again and again until he has three or four sometimes even five mares females oh my goodness that baby has just been born oh my goodness that baby has just been born this is how this is how it starts my goodness gracious it's still got still got the body sack on it the placental sack on it that baby zebra we've been sitting here watching other zebras and that zebra has just given birth so that's exactly how a herd is formed first with the dad and the mom and then one baby and then we get a second mom and third mom sometimes look at that little thing oh my goodness I have never seen it before I just thought because we saw another female walking into the shade with her baby I thought that it was just another one that was getting a licking but it's brand spanking new little zebra and she's going to lick off all of that stuff and within five to ten minutes that baby is going to be able to stand up and walk with mother what a beautiful thing to witness and we are right here witnessing this I'm sorry I'm lost for words Morgan I completely didn't hear your next question This is truly, truly special. Hello, hi, hi from Ireland Academics. How do they get the stripes? Well, they're born with them, as you can see. That little baby has just been born and it's got stripes on it already. And it is an evolutionary design that they have. And there's many reasons for the stripes, but how exactly it comes about uh, during the the design of the body is hard for me to explain uh, How do leopards have spots? Where does it come from? It's the way the fur grows from the skin and Even from brand spanking new babies. They are already covered in stripes. So how exactly it happens? I don't know That is something that happens inside the belly already inside the genetics of the animal and because the parents have got stripes out come the babies with stripes. I suppose if the dad was spotted and the mom was striped, you might get a variation. But because both of them are striped, it comes out with stripes. But a unique, unique, unique pattern on each one. Kids, this is unbelievable stuff. This is unbelievable. Did you know, Rian? She was licking too much. I was just thinking mum was giving the other one that we saw walk into the shade, a bit of a grooming. Oh yes, well, I did quit. Now have a look, it's trying to climb up. Mum's going to just keep cleaning it and licking it and nurturing it. And it's such a hot day that she's going to stand there and make sure it's got shade. But it's very important that this youngster's able to stand up soon. So it's able to move off with the family because, you know, would-be predators are around and would be a very big risk to a little baby like this. Oh, he's trying again. Oh, it's up. Oh, it's down again. It's up. Now that is the, the birth sack that's still stuck around its legs. It's making it very tricky for it to stand up, almost like having having a bag over your legs you know, when you try to to jump when you've still got your your trousers around your ankles it's very difficult so it's trying to get those off and then we'll be able to walk a bit easier but can you imagine the first steps of your life within minutes of being born you can get up and you can walk there we go 
is going. Oh my word. This is just priceless. Well done, Mama. It's been swimming in Mum's belly for 10 to 11 months. And now suddenly it's feeling gravity and walking with these legs. Brand new baby zebra. Well done, Mama. Well, I don't really know what to say. That is just so special to see. We are so blessed to be able to witness these things in nature. Nina Clues, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad your kids are watching it. It's not every day we get to see something like this. I've been in the bush for a long time. I've seen baby animals. I haven't seen many births. I've seen impala and buffalo giving birth. And I've never been privileged enough to see this. is blowing up but Steve well done that is absolutely amazing seeing a new born zebra that is fantastic uh, that is definitely something special but yep yeah, from uh, that uh, special sighting well we've also got a nice little special sighting here with all in to me a beautiful young uh, leopard that she's just enjoying a good old snooze up the side, but you all the wind has once again come through like it's anything. But the good thing about the wind is that it definitely is not going to rain because it'll just blow these clouds quickly past, and the clouds don't have that opportunity to offload the water. Hello, oh, look at that face! Look at that face! Isn't that now adorable? That is, oh, Ellie. She is so cute, so cute, and you can see she's still got that real cubbish look to her, I don't know, it's just there's still that little cubbish kind of face and uh, that look, <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's amazing. Now what I'm hoping that uh, this female stays in this area once she sets up her own territory and that's usually about three, three and a half years old when they'll start setting up their own territory. And usually what happens is they will kind of uh, grab a little piece of mom's territory and they'll start off with that and then they'll start expanding away from mom's territory. And then of course she'll have a nice little area of her own. And then from about three and a half, so about four years old, she'll start going into estrus, known as like heat, and then she'll go, um, well, she'll be ready to mate with a male. Hey, my girl, but she's only still, she's still very young. Still another year and a half, two years to go before that happens. Look at that tail. Such a thick tail, so beautiful blowing in the wind. 
She looks very comfortable. Very, very comfortable. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Sunset Safari. We're coming to you live from the Amakala Game Reserve, deep down in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa, otherwise known as Frontier Country. My name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera I've got Morgan. That is Morgan's thumb. Yes, it is. And those are red hartebeest. They were relaxing on the road and for some reason one of the bulls just came running across and then they all uh, did the same. But it's still rather hot and these are one of the animals that don't particularly bother too much with the heat. You do find them in arid, semi-arid areas. Uh, they're not too worried about water either. Um, so one of the animals that you might find out on the plains when it is particularly hot. Uh, black wildebeest, earlunt, springbok, also animals that uh, don't generally seek the shade uh, every time it is hot, um, but a lot of the other animals do. You know, these guys now seem to be slowly moving off, but uh, that's a nice little start to the show for us. I think our plan is to have a look and see if we can pick up on these three Madoda Flossi, as we would say here in Isiklosa, the three male coalition of cheetah. We're going to see if we can pick up any tracks or signs of them. They're probably also lying up in a thicket. Otherwise, maybe we'll go see what the lions are doing. So, Carter, who's seven years old, thanks for your question. Yes, I've seen lots of herds of antelope running like that, and they weren't scared by us. I don't know what they were scared from, but uh, sometimes the animals, all it takes is for one of them to run, and then they all just copy it. And sometimes it's like you may be in the classroom. One of your friends does something, and you all copy him. And the animals often do that. And you see this one now having a little drink from mum. There are lots of little ones here, and that one is getting its drink of milk. Very important for the little ones to get lots of milk so that they can grow very big and strong very quickly. Because the quicker they grow, the better it is for them to be able to get away from predators like lions, cheetah, and maybe even leopards. So I'm glad that that one's got its drink in, and it's going to be good because he's going to get a lot more energy and power from that. He'll grow up nice and strong, I'm sure. And with the help of mom protecting him, I'm sure he's going to be healthy and happy as they now disappear off behind the bush. So I think we're going to have to start up and head out and see what else we can find that will be exciting out here in the bush in South Africa. We're down near to the coast, near to the beach, so a little bit different to where it is in the Kruger National Park or that greater Kruger area where they are in Juma, where they find lots of leopards and lions and spotted hyenas. Here we don't find so many of those, but we do like to look for the cheetah. That's what's special here for us. So I'm hoping we can find them. But they can be quite difficult to find because they're very camouflaged. And when they lie in the thick bush, they're almost invisible. Can you help me spot them? I don't think they're anywhere around here for now. So I think we might have to move on and see. Maybe we'll see a little track on the road and see where they've crossed. And you can join us on the journey of tracking animals. But you see here a lovely landscape that we have and the wind is starting to pick up. Maybe it will give us a little bit of an inkling of where these cheetah are. We'll also listen out for any of the animals that will alarm call. Some of the alarm calls is normally around the sound of bah, 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 those kind of noises. If we hear that, that means that the animals have seen the cheetah and then we're going to go near to those animals and they'll be able to show us where the cheetah are. So if you give us a chance just to try and catch up with these cheetah, I think I'm going to send you over to Cedric who's already found a predator.
Yep, so we are still sitting here with our little Tsumi, this uh, young female leopard, still lying up uh, here, up in this green thorn tree, and she's just now and again giving us a little bit of an eyeball and thinking, what are you guys doing at the bottom? I'm so far up here, why don't you come and join me? No, I thought, no. rather not. We all think we'll just uh, stick to the vehicle and uh, yes, let her enjoy her time by herself up in that tree. But there's not much uh, we've looked now, and I think uh, I spoke to him Paul because he was here at the sighting this morning, and apparently there was a hyena that was around here and was roaming this area, so maybe it stole the kill. Kira from Rosemont, age seven. Thank you for joining us on our Wild Earth Sunset Safari and um, hoping that you are enjoying every little bit of it. But yes, which one runs faster than uh, between a leopard and a, a hyena? I mean, uh, a leopard and a cheetah? Well, you know, the che uh, cheetah is pretty much the fastest land mammal, running at about 100 to 110 kilometers an hour, where you'll find your leopard is around about, say, 80, 80 k's an hour. And that's still fast, 80, 85 k's an hour, so a leopard is very quick, but a leopard doesn't r run f long distance. It's a very quick dash, so if it sees a prey species, it has to be very close to the prey. So in other words, like impala or steenbok or any kind of prey species, it has to be very close, like 6-7 meters, and then it'll run quickly, like that 80, 85 k's an hour, quick, quick, a quick dash, and grab that prey species. Where a cheetah, they enjoy the big open areas, and why they enjoy those big open areas? Because then they can use that pace of theirs, that 110 kilometer pace, to actually chase after something. And they can chase up to about 300, 400 uh, meters, and that's quite a long distance, and then they can try and catch their prey species. So yeah, the cheetah is definitely by far the fastest land mammal around here, or in the world. But don't get me wrong, that's why a cheetah is 20, um, a leopard, it's about 25 meters a second. Hein from Island Academic, age seven. Good afternoon, thank you for joining us. And thank you for the question. Yes, uh, leopards, I'm sure they can fall out of a tree. Definitely, it's the same as us. Uh, like, you know, if you're walking, I'm sure we can trip, you know, and fall over. It's the same as a leopard, so then again, maybe by accident, you know, putting its leg or its paw at the wrong place, maybe on a dead branch or something, and putting all the weight on that dead branch, and <laughs> branch breaks, and the leopard will come tumbling down. So yes, I'm sure that does happen, but i hardly ever seen it. I've seen it with little cubs playing around in a tree, and they're falling out of the tree, but not a high tree like this, more like much, much lower, much smaller trees, and I've seen them falling out while they're busy playing. But uh, that is very, very seldom. Most of the time you'll find there are such agile cats. Look at that big tail, look at that thick tail, using it as a balancing um, uh, part of the body. And so it's easier, it's easiest way to kind of just uh, stay up in these branches. But yeah, no, it is amazing. It's beautiful. They are agile, they are brilliant. They can actually even walk on these little thin branches without even looking like they're gonna fall over. So it's amazing. And even with this kind of wind that's coming through now, and it's just sitting up there you're thinking well this leopard is uh, I'm sure this thing's gonna fall out but no nah, it'll stay up there but anyway while we are gonna sit here we're longer with our own Tsumi let's head over to Pridelands as Rexon wants to say hello to everybody good afternoon good afternoon see what we have found and welcome everyone back to school. We are looking forward all school that have joined us for the afternoon questions and uh, really for all kids across the world. I mean, it's a very exciting day. And thanks, Cedric, uh, before I go further, with all the leopard sighting down, guys, in sense, unbelievable. We have this wonderful breeding herd of uh, elephant, which are moving slightly to the north they're going in an area where possible we might not be able to follow them it will be the uh, end of uh, uh, our road here where they're going the other side we cannot manage to follow it's such amazing they're moving into area slowly by shore with uh, attention you can tell that it could be wind it could be something that uh, moves them from myself Rex in this afternoon 
and Owen behind the camera looking for a great afternoon joining by you here you may send us questions we are so much excited to answer all those questions from all kids from back to school unbelievable let's position ourselves according to this movement of elephant maybe we might uh, have something here you never know Cool, lovely. Thank you. We have question here. H10. Diana asking how elephants sleep. Uh, did they do sleep lying down? Sometimes, most of the time, you find them there against the termite. Termite is one of the uh, hills that are made by termite. The mound, actually, against it if it's really found on that area but in most cases you find them more especially the young one if they feel more tired they can lie on the ground easily uh, it depends how how hot and how how is the environment on that area sometimes you find them sleeping against the bank is how actually elephant did you did you lie down most cases we know that uh, people pass information that elephant they cannot lie down due to the body weight because they can squash the internal organs there's nothing like that they can do lie down on the ground and let's take this opportunity while this elephant disappearing into the thick bush of a two gems in sense well we found our lions and they have just killed an adult bull kudu. Now I know this might be difficult for some people to watch, and I'm sorry about that, but this is what lions do. They have to eat, they're allowed to eat, and they've killed a big antelope. And this happened very recently. Normally lions don't move around in the middle of the day, but I think that this happened probably uh, maybe an hour or two ago. And you can just see on the sort of left-hand side of the picture, you can see the young cub, and then you can see a kind of black thing close to his head. That's the horn of the kudu. So we've got one big male, three adult females, and five younger ones of varying ages. I'm actually going to say they have probably killed us about three hours ago. They look quite full already and they've eaten quite a lot. Now I was checking on foot, I was walking and I just heard this brrrr. So one of the lions saw me and basically said to me, that's far enough chum. So I quickly went back to the vehicle and then we came in here and look what we found. Cool hey? And in actual fact there are a few things that led us here while we were tracking, oh this is nice to see some affection between the lions. I hope it doesn't get too affectionate. If it does, your teachers can explain it. So there are a few things that led us here. First of all, the tracks on the road. That was nice. Secondly, kudu tracks running. We found kudu tracks and you can see when the animal has been running on the road. And thirdly, Olaf, the Viking who is on camera today, spotted some vultures in a tree and they had obviously spotted this kill long before we did and so we knew we were in business. And they will probably sit here devouring this kudu for the next, well, I don't know, maybe 12 hours or so. I think they'll have finished in about 12 hours time. And they'll alternate between lying down, going for a little drink and then coming back to feed. Isn't that exciting? I think it's really exciting. <laughs> I think 
can see the wind is blowing and that makes it really really good for lions when they're trying to hunt in the middle of the day Hello, Aubrey, aged seven again. You want to know if lions eat every day. It depends on what they eat. So if they eat something very small, like a baby kudu, for example, then yes, they'll probably eat the next day. But after this meal, they'll probably not need to eat in three or four days. And they really did need this meal because the youngsters were looking very skinny. We saw them last night and they ate half a piece of impala and the males stole most of it and then the rest went without anything. And so luckily for them, they managed to kill this for lunch, pretty much. Wow. We got very lucky today, hey? In fact, your school drive's been spectacular. Brand new baby zebra, amazing. Leopard in a tree, even more amazing. Lions on a kill, pretty amazing. Elephants and those hartebeest. It's been spectacular so far. I hope one day you'll be able to come out on safari and maybe you'll see this live. listen carefully you might just be able to hear them growling at each other they're not very friendly at the kill <laughs> so they're not like a family eating around a table they get very cross with each other when they're feeding sometimes they have a big fight and then afterwards they'll all make up rub each other's heads and make each other feel better. Chana, you're wondering how on earth these lions catch their food or how they hunt? Well, they're called stealth or ambush hunters. So what they'll do is just walk along and if they smell or see something that could be prey like this kudu, the lionesses will go in different directions and they will go through the thick bush and move very quietly. The cubs will stay back. The male will sometimes help with the hunt, sometimes he won't. And they'll go very slowly through the bush until they've surrounded something like this kudu, and then they'll chase it. And obviously, I think this kudu was very close to the road. Maybe he was even having a drink at one of the watering holes here. And maybe they came across him at the watering hole and just chased him. So I think this is what we'd call an opportunistic kill, which means that they were probably going for a drink themselves. This guy happened to be having a drink, they chased him and they managed to kill him. Because as I say, normally they would hunt at night. <laughs> hello, hello Cohen from Island Academics. You're wondering if the lions will keep the bones as toys. No, Cohen, they won't. They'll eat most of the bones, and the really big bones they'll leave with the hyenas. The hyenas will come and eat those. So, <laughs> no, no, I, I don't think they'll keep any for toys. Lions don't really have toys, although I say that. Young cubs will often play with sticks or pieces of big elephant dung or that sort of stuff. But, and, I suppose you might say if they, you know, if they found an old bone, they might play with it for a while, yeah. But they won't purposely keep any of the bones in this kill. They wouldn't like to do that. They don't worry about such things. Animals out here are very unlike us human beings. They don't keep anything. They don't keep any material possessions. They don't have toys or books or bags or beds or toothbrushes, anything like that. It's just them.
Hello, Diana, age 13 at Island Academics. You're wondering how many babies lions have at a time. Well, they can have up to six at a time. Normally, it's around three or four. And sadly, very few of those will actually make it to adulthood. So up to six, normally three or four. And I don't know if these particular babies are all from the same litter. I don't think they are. Some of them are older than the others. Now if you look at that one with his backside facing us, you can see his hips sticking out. Now that's because he's in dire need of some food. Really needs to eat. And you can see now he's had a good meal. Face is in blood. And they'll clean that off each other as soon as they've finished eating. Otherwise their faces would start to stink. I can think they were really, really hungry, these lions, because this is a big animal. A kudu is the same size as those hartebeest you were seeing. And that's a good 270 kilograms, which is a huge amount of meat for them to devour. Mashatu Game Reserve has a glowing reputation as one of the most beautiful reserves in Southern Africa. And now, atop a soaring cliff overlooking the Majale River beneath the groves of Euphorbia succulents sits the stunning new Mashatu Euphorbia Villas. These eco-friendly villas echo their beautiful natural surroundings shaped to match the Mapanu parts of Mashatu. Enjoy earthy glamour with a consciousness for conservation woven into every element of these camps within the 32,000 hectare reserve. So our lions are still having a feast here. And they're going to be so full after this, they're gonna have a nice long sleep. And it is a bit gruesome, I know. And it can be sad to see that an animal has died, but I suppose there's an important lesson here, you know, for us as human beings. I always take this as a lesson. We do feel sad about this sort of thing, but we must remember that a lot of us also eat meat, and that's just the same for the lions, you know. That's a good thing to remember.
think they've been eating for about three hours. They're starting to breathe very heavily, and as soon as the sun came out and started to shine on them, they started going. <sighs> Hello, Darina. You're from Rosemont and you're aged seven and you want to know how big lions get. Well, a big male lion like the one we saw there probably weighs around 200 to 200, and, yeah, about 200 kilograms, so 440 pounds, and a lioness about 120 kilograms, so about, hmm, what's that, 250 or 60 pounds or so. So that's how big they get. They stand at the shoulder, so if I was to stand next to that big male, about 1.2 meters or so, so just over th almost four feet. So it would take me up to just below my rib cage, roughly. And then the female is just a bit shorter than that. So they're big. I mean, they're much bigger than any dog you've ever seen. They're bigger than any cat that you can find in the Americas, much bigger than a mountain lion or a cougar, much bigger than a jaguar. The only cat in the world that is bigger than one of these is a tiger. And they don't occur in Africa. Tigers only occur in Asia. So they really are huge, huge cats. Smaller than a bear, for example, those of you who are in the US will no doubt have had some experience or have read about or know somebody who's had experience of brown bears and black bears. And they're, they're smaller than both of those species of bear. But they are fearsome hunters, as you can see. And you see how she's panting like that? It's not because it's so hot. She's panting like that because she's eaten so much that she can hardly breathe. And despite the fact that they've still, that they've eaten so much and eaten so well, they're still quite cross with each other. Diana, age seven, you want to know if you can see a dingo on safari? No, you can't see a dingo, Dariana. Dingoes are only found in Australia. You don't find dingoes here in Africa. In Africa, we've got wild dogs, and they don't really look like dingoes. So I'm afraid you can only find a dingo in Australia. We're a long way from Australia. A good 18 hour flight from Australia. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Good. I always like to get a new question. Never been asked, do we get dingoes here in Africa? The closest thing to a dingo that we'd get here is called a jackal. Maybe you were talking about jackals. So we'd get a black-backed jackal or a side-striped jackal. It's about the same size as a dingo. We have been so lucky today, kids. Really, really lucky. From leopards to lions to elephants to newborn zebras. Unfortunately, you have seen a kudu, but it isn't really very much alive. But you have seen one. Hartebeests and lots of beautiful environments here in South Africa. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you'll join us again on safari sometime. And it's been an absolute pleasure answering your questions. Bye-bye. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised.
Yeah, what a beautiful way to start our sunset safari here on Wild Earth with, of course, Nsumi, this beautiful young female leopard that's just really resting up in this beautiful tall green thorn and enjoying the cool breeze this afternoon here at Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sand, South Africa. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cedric Dold, and behind the camera here on Rusty, we've got Muscles Mpo. So thank you for joining us. And what a way to start this afternoon's uh, sunset safari. As you can see, this beautiful leopardess just enjoying a good old afternoon snooze. But yes, it is a live and interactive show. So if anybody's got any questions and comments, suggestions, please send them through to us. And I'm hoping that we can answer as many questions as possible. But yes, it is quite a windy afternoon around here. As you can see, the leaves is blowing profusely. But as we've had such an amazing afternoon, a great start to, of course, back to school with all the kids and fantastic questions that came through to us this afternoon. Of course, uh, in uh, Pridelands, we had old Rexon and Owen, and I think uh, Rexon has been also out this afternoon. And yes, we had old and, uh, James and Paul on Sparky, and old James found some, uh, of course, the Telemati breakaways on a Kudu Kill around, I think, close to Gary Dam, if I'm not mistaken, which is fantastic. And of course, uh, Steve is out this afternoon with uh, Rian, and down there at Amakara, we've got Ralph and uh, Morgan. So definitely we've had some amazing things. And oh yes, Stephen Madikwe, he had a zebra, uh, a newborn zebra, which was fantastic. Can you believe it? And especially for the kids to really witness uh, that baby zebra's first uh, steps. That is amazing here on wild earth. But yeah, as I say, we are sitting here with uh, this beautiful Nsumi. Still exactly the same uh, area where she was this morning. I think James and Mpo, they came into this area this morning and found her here on a Steenbok hill. Good afternoon, girl. And uh, looks like that Steenbok is gone. There's no kill left. I'm looking in the tree. There is absolutely nothing left. So I think she might have dropped that kill. There was a hyena that was roaming around here during the day. Henry, good afternoon. Yes, definitely a fur day. And uh, uh, once again, it's a, a fur day. I think there's a lot of uh, cats around again this afternoon. And especially having such a beautiful young, uh, young leopard that's uh, enjoying this, this tree and the cool breeze up there. Definitely, it's going to be, and once again, an amazing drive. I can just feel it. I can just see it. I feel it in my fingers and in my toes. Yes. But yes, it's nice to see Nsumi. I haven't seen Nsumi for quite some time. I think it's a good uh, maybe two months, three months when uh, the last time I saw Nsumi and I was on Chitwa driveway, new driveway. So it's good to see this girl again. And I mean, she's still young. She's about a year and a half old. She was born in June 2021. And of course, her mom is Kuchava. So she's still in mom's territory, but this is a typical time when a female leopard uh, cub uh, leaves its mom or a juvenile leaves a mom and becomes independent and of course starts roaming around in mom's territory, doing her own hunting and just learning, you know, her life skills, which is very important to them. And then usually about like maybe three years old, she'll start, of course, finding her own territory and usually from... Pretty much, she kind of, I can say, starting a territory of her own, um, breaking off from her mom's territory, and then that's about three, three and a half years old. But yeah, while we are going to sit here with her and Sumi, let's see what the weather is like today. Now, good day and welcome to this end of the Sunset Safari. Lovely to be with you. As you can see, we have got the Talamati pride of lions. Same ones we had yesterday. Same ones that nearly set upon the six pack of dogs. And uh, they have managed to kill a kudu during the course of the afternoon. I think probably at around two o'clock, I would say maybe one o'clock. 
My name is James Hendry. Hello. Yes, good. If you've just joined us and you weren't on the school drive, never mind. Um, school drives are fun, though. Still worth being on with us. Please ask us as many questions as you can. We have got the Viking on camera, and he's dressed in marine blue of two different kinds today, so that's quite appropriate, I think, for his ancestry. Let's go back to the lions. And we're just going to see three of them have now walked off behind us, including the big male, the Mbali, or S8 male, one big lioness, and now one of the youngsters. Now, I don't know where they're going because there's no water close by. Well, lion lover, apparently they do hunt during the day. I think that this is an opportunistic kill. I think they probably went looking for some water and found this kudu either trying to have a drink or doing something similar, maybe just eating nearby. And I think they just set upon him because their tracks come down the road. They don't necessarily fan out. And then you can see the kudu tracks running on the road. And then just beyond that, you can see this situation of gore and horror if you happen to be a kudu. Yeah, the more I look at it, the older I think this kill is. Maybe 12 o'clock or so. I mean, there are a lot of lions, of course, and they're all having a good feed, and they have been having a good feed. So it's possible that the kill was around 12. It's very fresh, and they've done a good job of devouring it. Sharon the cubs will start hunting with the rest of the pride around about a year. But they'll make a horrible mess of most kills and most hunts until they are a little bit more competent. And I suspect some learn faster than others. But by about 18 months, they should be relatively useful. And by two years, fully useful, if not quite at full size. It's no mean feat hunting out here. I've got to tell you, I think it's, you know, the animals are, or the, the prey animals are all designed to avoid being killed by things like lions. And so to learn to hunt is a very difficult thing. And I think, you know, I feel quite sorry for things like leopards, which don't have the joy or luxury of learning to hunt with a pride. They just have to learn to do it. But it's one of the reasons that they start on much smaller prey. Hmm. I was getting quite frustrated trying to find these things. It took us quite a while in the end, but very satisfying when we did. It's a fully grown adult kudu of at least six years old. Three full turns in his horns. Right, the Vov has had a spectacular afternoon so far. He had a baby zebra earlier on that had just taken its first step. So let's go up to him and find out what he's doing. Well, welcome to Medikwe, everybody, where what you're seeing in front of you, if you're just joining us, is a brand new baby zebra that's um, just been moving around, getting very accustomed to those gangly little legs. <laughs> and we've, we've had to park in the shade because we've had quite an awkward angle. And so we're just going to stay with this for a moment because we haven't had the best views of it, actually. That's probably about as good a view as we've had for some time. But um, it finally extricated it from the placental sac. Mum did a bit of licking and grooming and helped to, to make it stand, but it did most of the work 
on its own. Look at that. Isn't that just so special? Taryn, a barcode is born. There we have it. Well, I suppose we better introduce ourselves quickly before we forget. But uh, hello, everybody. My name is Steve, and I'm joined by Rihanna Cameron. We've had the most delightful afternoon. We stopped here just to frame some zebras for the kids' drive, and we saw a female licking. And then suddenly there was a sack, and then, oh my goodness, baby zebra straight out of its mother's belly. And there it is in the open. We're getting some wonderful views of it now. Almost a year gestation period. Almost a year, 11 months. It's a long time. But uh, that's what enables it to be able to walk pretty soon after birth, you see. I mean, it's, it's a little bit difficult. But... Uh, 11-15 minutes up and uh, some people have seen them cantering with the herd after 44 minutes. I don't see this little one cantering anytime soon and it's probably been about that time. It's probably been at least that. We've been sitting here for a good 45 minutes. Um, it's found uh, mum's udders and it's managed to suckle but uh, it's walking very gingerly uh, now, generally when they give birth, the stallion will stand nearby and just watch. Jerry, that's a good question. I mean, that's what we see in uh, giraffe and we see it in wildebeest, but I haven't seen anything attached to the zebra. I think, I don't know how it works. I think there's a different system, but I have absolutely no idea. Um, definitely in wildebeest and giraffe, we see that. Um, I can't recall seeing it on Impala. I might have missed it. But I haven't seen anything, and I've actually been looking on this zebra's belly, and I haven't seen anything. So, some interesting things. The first time for me to see, not the actual birth, but we must have missed it by moments. Must have missed it by moments. Mum was licking very casually. The herd was all calm and relaxed. No one was causing any fuss. But an individual zebra did try and come close just now, and she... Um, she pushed it away with her ears flat, a bit of an aggressive posture. And she's been eating since. No time to rest. What a splendid way to start the afternoon. And a surprising one. Gareth, no rolls at all. The stallion will protect, and the other members will stay away. They obviously will be interested, but even her previous offspring gets pushed away um, initially. She's got lots of time for her baby, and no one else is welcome. No one else will come too close. Obviously, the rest of the group is there for, to be vigilant, and to detect predators, and the stallion will step forward and assist in defense of the youngster if the need arises. Isn't that just precious? A little mini me. Very closely attached to mum. The two of them will spend the first few days pretty much like that, attached at the hip, where they imprint each other's pattern. It might not seem like an important thing to do, but when you're in very large herds, imprinting the pattern is very important.
Yes, yeah, so okay. we're still sitting here with uh, Nsumi, and uh, she's just grooming herself at the moment now. Just wondering if she's not going to come down very soon, as uh, there is no kill left up in this tree, so uh, she's starting to move in. But it's such a high tree, and uh, uh, I'd love to see her coming down here. She's looking down, so if she comes down, I might have to move forward if we can then get the tr trunk, but we'll just see if she's going to do that. But she's looking like she wants to come down. She's stand, sitting up a little bit, but it's going to be quite uh, a mission for her to maneuver down this tall, tall green thorn. And uh, wow, very impressive that you actually even went up in the in this tree. It just shows you how agile a leopard is and how strong they are to actually take up uh, a kill, drag a kill like a steenbok and uh, take it so high up in into a tree like this now. And I mean, she's still young. I mean, a year and a half and she can do that. So. I mean, they are really, really powerful cats. And I mean, I've seen her grandmother, and her grandmother was uh, Tandi. And I've seen her grandmother actually killed, not too far from here, funny enough, on Chitwa New Driveway. And she brought down a fully, fully grown uh, kudu female. So that is, I mean, that is just huge. Of course, you couldn't take it up in the tree. That is just way too much, just way too heavy. But uh, I've seen her take down a full-grown uh, kudu, and uh, unfortunately she lost it because she couldn't take up, uh, take the kudu up into a tree. And of course hyenas came into the area and stole it from her. So yeah, and I mean Tandi was not a big, a big leopard. She was maybe a 30, 35 kg uh, leopard. Oh, it looks like maybe she wants to lie down. There we go. Picture perfect. There we go. Oh, look at that. How sweet. Nsumi, yes, look at you. This is like a photographer's dream once again, just having a leopard like this lying into, lying in a green thorn. And um, especially that the sun slowly but surely is going to hit her on the face. I think it is going to be absolutely stunning. <laughs> she's looking down. I think she's, she's contemplating about uh, making that move. Oh, is she? Well, no, she's contemplating on sleeping. Don't worry about that. <laughs> no, I think she knows how to get down. And I think she's uh, she's experienced enough for, for a year, you know, a year and a half old uh, cat, a leopard as it is. You know, she, I'm sure she knows how to maneuver down the street. But I think it's just one of those things like uh, the effort. I can imagine. I wonder if she even came down during the day. Uh, Josh, and uh, you'll find that uh, they will still, um, you know, if, if Kushava comes into the area and that, you'll find in Sumi definitely will come down and she'll go to her mom. Definitely. It's still that typical uh, mother and daughter uh, bond. That bond doesn't, doesn't just break immediately. There's still that bond that goes, uh, goes on. Um, and she'll come down and they'll still greet each other, but you'll find um, it's not that real friendliness anymore. It's more kind of snarling and growling at each other and a bit of snarling. And mom's like, you know, just move, move, move out, move on, you know, do your own thing. And uh, so you'll find that they'll, they'll have that reaction towards each, uh, to each, towards each, uh, each other, but there won't be any kind of vicious fight and, uh, you know, blood and or anything like that. No, it'll be just a snarling and that. And then, of course, and Sumi will respect her mom's. Uh, you know, uh, her behavior, and she'll just stay away and do her own thing. But I mean, a year and a half, as I said, for a female leopard, a year and a half is usually the time where they move away most of the time, like become almost completely independent. If it's a male cub, a male uh, leopard will stay with mom up to about a year and nine months. So you'll stay longer with mom. You'll actually kind of, uh, how can I say, uh, take that advantage of mom uh, hunting skills and all that and uh, feed on mom's skill most of the time in, um, at that age. The uh, reason why she doesn't want to chase a young male out that easily because he actually he becomes bigger than mom around about a year and a half to a year and eight months. He starts becoming bigger than mom and she's like, she feels intimidated by his size. And that's usually the male's job to kind of, kind of push the young male out of the area or away from mom.
I must have just keeping a close eye. You never know. Maybe Kushava comes in here. Yeah. <laughs> Zoe, you think we need to call the fire department to get it done? Yeah. Okay, I just get that like kind of the typical picture of getting that long ladder and putting the ladder against the tree and then kind of uh, you know grabbing her and bringing her down. But yeah, clearly, uh, yeah, I think I will come down with uh, with this leopard, and I don't think I will be returning home anytime soon after that. Then to one, I'll be hanging in the tree. I'll be in Tumi's new toy <laughs> or food source uh, I was hoping uh, come on come down she's thinking about it I've got a feeling she's thinking about it she's looking around you can just see her behavior she keeps on looking down she's becoming a little bit restless she keeps on looking down to the ground I think I'm just checking if she wants to I'm sure it just seems like she yep there yeah, I just thought so I think I'm gonna I might have to go a little bit forward if we do, because then we've got that uh, uh, tree trunk, and I want to see how she maneuvers down this. You all right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm poor, just uh, got attacked by a, a butterfly. <laughs> uh, I think the other vehicle's going to come in here now. Come on. She's thinking about it. She's. Yeah, no, <clears throat> no Morgan. No, no, that's that's the scary part that a poor can't take on a butterfly. And, uh, oh, there's a hyena. There's a there's a hyena there. I don't know who it is, but there's a hyena that's coming into the picture now. I think that maybe that's what she was looking at. Maybe that's what she, just want to take a look there quickly. I'm not too sure which hyena, uh, do you know which one in Paul? And Paul's very good at the hyenas. Yes, <laughs> Paul's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, it looks, who is that, Corky? No, it's Ribbon, eh? No, it's Ribbon. We've got Ribbon here. Can you believe it? Hello. And she's the very, she looks like she's got teats, like the teats are swollen. Ribbon, welcome. Can you believe it? That is, well, now that is a surprise to all of us, huh? I'm sure. Okay, sorry, are you coming to me? Uh, I'll just wait, maybe Ribbon comes back. No, she's moving further away. It definitely looks like ribbons had uh, like a teacher swollen. Very interesting. Hmm. All right, we're gonna quickly swing around, guys. Let's just take a look at uh, the teats. Yes, look, look, you'll see. Look at ribbons teats. Are very swollen, full of milk. Hey, do you think she's got? Uh, New cubs? Could it be? Is it possible? Wow. Well, that is going to be interesting because definitely uh, she's cause she is uh, she is definitely carrying a lot of milk there. Hmm. I mean, I don't know what happened to Spirit and. Uh, and uh, Matimba, that's her two cubs. So that's just another, I mean, I haven't seen them for maybe two months, three months. And I can see Nsumi is just, just watching her, keeping a close eye. So amazing, absolutely amazing. All right, well, we are going to just sit here and just take a look around here. Let's head over to Rexon in Pridelands.
It is lovely. We are with the, the breeding heart of elephant. It's a beautiful, beautiful afternoon. Of course, if you look at the weather, it's such amazing here. Uh, overcast cloud. It really, really makes the picture of an elephant even a lot more beautiful. I'd really uh, enjoy the day of, of today. All the drive, or all the sightings uh, with James and Cedric. Uh, it's amazing. And to me and the lions on the kill, and we have this beautiful elephant. And Steve with the baby zebra. Unbelievable. I'm so jealous. I wish I can be there. Uh, we are <coughs> facing to the west. I think this elephant they might turn around and head in our direction east or west towards the water source. It is unbelievable. If you look at the way they're behaving now, even if it's windy, remember each and every animal, soon wind breaks, they change behavior. The reason behind that all the species is not like us human beings. They rely on a sense of a smell in quite more to, most of things that they do. So if they get any scent that uh, it really comes from far, it could be human being in the area, it could be lions, it could be anything. It makes them self grumpy. Most especially if it's windy, never ever try to find a uh, cheetah because all the time they'll run away from you. Because the, really the sound of the bush and the wind and the f information that they get from the, the wind itself, it makes them nervous. We have seen the elephant yesterday at uh, Lovu Dam. They just drink water and all suddenly run away. Because it was a human habitant, they get the scent of human come from all different angles. And due to these guys, because they do have youngster, their breeding head, you know that all the time they will avoid human beings, they will avoid lions. They must sometimes they might fight back with lions. So they are a lot more protective. So it's going to change the behavior of the species itself, more especially in a very wind afternoon like today. Otherwise, they are so amazing. I, I really love this uh, setting of that elephant, the way they're so calm. And for sure, that makes them to be relaxed. It food in the area. There's water, there's quite a lot of bushes, there's a lot of leaves and grass. Here at Wild Earth, we take great pride in curating our best animal content for you. Would you like our very best animal stories? highlights, questions, and the inside scoop on all things Wild Earth before anyone else? Find it all, as well as info on our exciting plans going forward first, in the newsletter Handmade Just For You. Available to all Wild Earth explorers.
No. Spas, yes, it is definitely common for wild dogs to steal from, at least lions to steal from wild dogs, um, like they did last night, absolutely, for sure. Now, an interesting quest, uh, bit of information coming in from Shreyas, thank you very much. I believe there's been some debate over whether we should call this the Talamati breakaways or the Talamatis for real. I don't really care which one it is, but we're going to call these the Talamati breakaways for now, because that's what, that's the information I have. And Shreyas has given me the information on the cubs. <coughs> Thank you, Shreyas. Three cubs. First set of cubs were born on in December 2021, the next set in December 21 slash January 22, and the rest in July 2022. The youngest, three, and one cub from the first litter did not make it. Yeah, interesting. Wow. So if I understand this correctly, these cubs are all a year old. Now, I would have said that they're pretty small for yearlings. Maybe it's just a long time since I've seen a yearling lion. It's interesting. I wonder if they aren't perhaps a little bit undernourished, overstressed by life. That's interesting. I really wouldn't have said that they were close to a year old. But let's face it, my ability to discern size and recognize things is very poor. So thank you, Shreyas, very much for that information. That's a nice piece of joint there being licked free of now blackening meat that has been in the sun. This looked like a kudu in his prime to me. So we're not glorying in the death here or in the gore. It's just unfortunately what happens out here. It's not unfortunate, it's just what happens. So let's go to Amakala with Ralph and see if there isn't a slightly more gentle scene unfolding there. It is a more gentle scene for now, but we've been able to catch up with the three amigos and their bellies have shrunk somewhat uh, in the time that we've uh, been away from them or they've been away from us because they were on our doorstep for a while and um, they had pretty much engulfed or swallowed a kudu and they could hardly walk but now they're uh, they're up they're moving well these two are lying in the shade but they have been up they've been chasing each other around and it seems like they were also trying to hunt a warthog um, so I think uh, we might see some action from them now as it's starting to cool off and so it's the perfect time for these cats to be active and it is my three friends the three male coalition of cheetah and what better way to spend the afternoon than with them we'll wait and see what they do and we'll just keep following they have kept me absolutely entertained it's been wonderful the time I've spent with them and I'm hoping we can spend lots more time with them in the future. I'm sure they would have uh, probably defecated an enormous amount uh, in the last day or so. And with their tummies having gone down, I think those calories, the energy, everything that they've got from that meat will be incredible. And I'm sure they've probably grown quite a bit in this little time as well. It's crazy how quickly they actually digest the food because their stomachs were huge.
Debra, thanks for jumping on with us in the largest game drive in the world. It is uh, absolutely fascinating and I love this concept of uh, this virtual safari. We do have another game viewer with us with um, actual people on a vehicle but you know not everybody's able to be in the game reserves or uh, on a, a game viewer at a particular time so even people that do come out and they here in person when they go home they continue on watching on wild earth so it's absolutely fabulous and we get lots of compliments from people that um, have come and uh, just to come and see it for themselves but then go home and continue on watching the progress of the lions the elephants and now our new characters the three amigos so everybody wants to know what's been going on with them and even if they can't be here in person they go home and watch on the website Kimberly, I'm just as surprised as you. It's very, it's amazing how fast they've digested it. I mean, that was, was yesterday, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yesterday. That they, they were absolutely rotund. And it's um, pretty much all been digested. They're looking, not skinny, but compared to yesterday, they're looking very skinny. So they're just starting to go down there a little bit. We might lose sight of them soon, and I'll then just try and catch up with them. I think they have all the potential of going for another hunt here, yeah? but jeepers, if they take down another sizable animal, like that female kudu that they did, this is uh, going to make for another feast. But we'll see. I think it's pretty random uh, what they're going to take down. Um, and in this period, maybe learning what they what they prefer going for, and then they might start to sp specialize a little bit later. Um, but for now, it's pretty much whatever jumps out in front of them. Anyway, give me a chance to go down and catch up a little bit more with our spotted cats. And uh, well, it seems we can continue on the trend. Over you go to Cedric. Thank you, Ralph. Well done on those uh, three musketeers there in, uh, in Amakala. Beautiful to see those uh, three male, male cheetahs. I haven't seen a cheetah for such a long time. I can't even remember when last I've seen a cheetah. <sighs> oh. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Then last year, no, not last year. It was a year before, 2021. That's the last time I've seen a cheetah pretty much almost the same year as uh, Nsumi when she was born so yeah long long time but yes good old Nsumi definitely I thought she was going to come down from this uh, tree not too long from now but it uh, seems like she's very much relaxed and just enjoying a good old rest again we did have uh, Roman coming through here thank you uh, Shreyas I do appreciate it yeah I'm sure Spirit and if Spirit and Matimba is still alive um, of course, they will still be suckling from uh, from ribbon, so maybe that could be the case why she's still the teats are still so large. So very, very true. So yeah, maybe that's uh, maybe all spirit and Matimba are still around. It'd be nice to see them again. But I just uh, did speak to one of the guides around here, and he said that um, uh, ribbon has been spending a lot, a lot of time around Chitwa camp. So so she's been. Pretty much utilizing this area quite a bit compared to a Juma area. Uh, Lucas, I'm sure there's a lot of trees around here in the territory of the parents of the mom, and I'm sure like uh, they've used you know certain trees more than once. But, you know, it's not like a specific tree that they'll keep on going up and in, in enjoying. They'll kind of enjoy something like the marula trees in the territory, the big jackalberries. They'll know certain trees around here. They'll know exactly where to go and which ones are going to be comfortable. But it's not always going to be the case where they'll use exactly the same trees as the parents. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they, they, that's, they've got their own, I can say, uh, interest in certain trees and which ones they prefer. But Ntsumi looks like likes a torchwood. I hardly ever see a leopard uh, in a torchwood tree. 
Um, it's got a lot of a lot of uh, modified thorns or modified branches, if you want to call it that, and very 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 uh, sharp branches and uh, like thorns, and those things can really do a lot of damage to you, to a person. And uh, even if they are lying on the ground, these uh, thorns or the branches from this uh, green thorn, um, it can even cause punctures to these tires. They're very very tough thorns. And of course the branch itself doesn't look like, there's no thorns on the branch itself or the thick, uh, I can say, branched out branch where she's lying. I think there is nothing there, so that's why she's enjoying that, that side of the tree. But a typical cat pose or leopard pose and of course, each front leg is pretty much draped on the side and it looks very comfortable. Lovely, joining us. Beautiful, beautiful weather. It looked like the sun just opened as we are live with you here with this elephant. We're going to stay with this elephant until we're able to get to see them, all of them coming into the open, then we can able to see much more details, who is involved, how many, how many youngster. It's very interesting with his head, it looked like they become a resident of the area. Since i am been back here, I've seen this elephant uh, not moving out. And they like Marshall Road up to um, Lovo Dam here. Pride Land Echo Training Safari Live. It's always the elephant around Lovo Dam. I really prefer to be in the area because I always, if I want to see elephant, I know where to go. It's unbelievable. You know that elephant are home range species, but sometimes elephant can have preference of the area like this uh, breeding herd of elephant they do have their own preference of the area it could be because of water and vegetation let's enjoy this elephant while we're still waiting for them to show much more details and how many they mean individual then we can know in details i'd like to study this elephant and follow them all the time in a daily basis and see what they're up to they break up in a small a unit and they all get together sometimes it's very confusing if you don't understand the behavior of an elephant they're not like 10 50 they're more than that we have seen that there can be around 50 elephant all together and it's nice to study them what time they join together most of the time let's enjoy look at the little one really amazing The muscles of trunk is exercising there. You can tell that uh, you use quite a lot of front feet and the trunk itself. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Copy from the mother. It's taking dust on the ground and pour itself on the head. All is now peaceful at the kill site. The lions have all stopped eating. They are all fat. One of them has departed to relieve himself behind the rest of the pride, which I think, as far as lion manners go, uh, must make him something of a rarity. He has not decided to go within nose shot of the rest of his friends. Well, I think that was nice of him. Many lions would not have been quite so generous. Karen, you're wondering where I am with the lions. Well, for those of you who know Juma Private Game Reserve, we are on a road called Pangolin Track. 
We're pretty much smack bang in the middle of the property, well sort of middle to south if you like. Yeah, so on a road called Pangolin Track, not too far from the famous Treehouse Dam. And I don't know how much more feeding they're going to do, but I, th I think that they're going to carry on probably, I would say, until 12 o'clock tonight. No, Donna, the carcass does not smell. Um, I can't smell it at all. The wind isn't blowing towards us. There'd be a kind of, um, I don't know if you've... <laughs> This always reminds me of rat dissection in first year at university. That kind of smell of innards you'd get if you were sitting quite close to it or the other side of it, where the wind was blowing towards you. Then I suppose you'd get a smell of innards. Here we go. Here's the lioness coming back now to have a bit of a bite, maybe. Now, she, to me, looks pregnant, and I could be talking garbage but she just looks quite heavy around the belly if you compare it to the other lioness who's eaten just as much I could be talking absolute garbage though it is very difficult to tell if they're pregnant So fascinating times here for the Talamati breakaways. Now, the lions are in complete flux here, as far as I can work out. I have just kind of returned to the area, trying to figure out what's happening. Talamati breakaways, three lionesses, five cubs now. S8 male seems to be spending a lot of his time with these guys. Uh, I'm not sure of the makeup of the others. And I know that the Inkuhumas have split into various different factions which is totally normal uh, when male takeovers happen and when the prides get too big and sometimes just because. But I'm now actually quite pleased we've had this group for two days in a row. It's helped cement their makeup in my brain. And Shreya's just commenting there that apparently quite a few of us have said that these cubs don't look a year old, that they look quite young. So I'm glad it wasn't just me that said that. And Giraffe Girl just commenting, which is also quite nice, that they have not been this far south before. So that is interesting. So perhaps they're wedging a territory for themselves uh, where the other Talamatis aren't, or maybe there's other pressure from the north. I'm not sure. It's going to take a little while for me to figure it out. And one of these lionesses, yes, as we worked out, lost all of her cubs. Keep the info coming, people. It's really good stuff and lovely to learn. Now, the closest water to here is probably Treehouse Dam, actually, which is not too far. Sorry, the other radio is going in my ear, Morgan. Morgan's directing the show. Go again with that question from Kelsey, if you wouldn't mind. Kelsey. Ah, do coalitions have conflict over the distribution of kills? Um... I'm not sure what you mean by distribution of kills. So male lions who form coalitions will fight over food, absolutely. Uh, they will fight with the prides over food. But I'm not sure what you mean by over the distribution of kills. 
Um, it's probably me being thick, but I can't quite work out what you're asking there. So they will always fight over food and they will take the lion's share of the kill if you like. Does that answer your question? If it doesn't, by all means send through another one saying, no, you gormless twit, this is what I meant. Now we're going to get a good look at the typical feeding of a lioness using all of her substantial and varied dentition to get into her food. The little incisors for the very fine bits, the canines to dig in, and then the carnassials or molars to scissor bits of meat off the skin and the bone and to crush bone too. They'll eat quite a lot of kudu bone. Kudus don't have bones as thick as buffaloes, so the bones will provide quite a lot of nutrition. Antique, the S8 male, I'm afraid, has gone to ground underneath a bush in such deep grass that, no, we can't really get a view of him. I can try a little bit. Maybe when we go off air again, I'll see if I can reposition and get a view of him, but I really don't think we'll be able to. I think he's so flat and fat and satisfied and happy in the grass underneath a bush that I don't think we're going to get a good view of him right now. He might come back a little bit later. In fact, I'm sure he will come back a little bit later. He'll just digest a bit, make enough space for him to have another helping and then come and swat the rest of the pride away. Which is, uh, well, that's just what lions do. It is so funny, though, to watch them on a... Um, <laughs> to watch them after a kill like this, I find so fascinating, because they're so mean to each other at the table. I mean, afterwards, there's this kind of regretful cleaning and aloe grooming that takes place as if to say you know I, I didn't mean what I said to you last night I didn't mean to nearly take your eye out uh, you know I, I'm so sorry for putting a big hole underneath your nose and then everyone kind of forgives each other and yeah they, they don't seem to mind some of you agreeing with me that the lioness could be pregnant She's lost her last two litters, apparently. Ah, sorry, Morgan, I missed that again. Can we have it once more? Oh, Cindy B, you're wondering at this corpulence whether they'll be able to run away from other prides. Uh, yes, they would, but they wouldn't want to. I think they're establishing themselves here. Now, for those of you who don't know any of the history, the Inkohuma pride and the Styx pride used to occupy this exact area where we are. This was kind of a boundary for them. Inkohuma pride, very famous, and went off to the north um, for a while. Sticks, sticks with the southern areas and then everything kind of shifted and the Inkohumas ended up going way south in fact all the way down to Londolozi onto the Sand River and the Talamatis then came into this area and now the Talamatis have split and the Talamatis I think are establishing themselves here and the way that the reason that's relevant to you Cindy D is that you know with this pride here and them establishing themselves, it's very unlikely that another pride would come anywhere near here. The prides hold exclusive territories, and unless there was you know, some, some nomadic pride or there was actual conflict and these guys were nomadic and they'd walked into another pride's territory, it really would be very unusual for them to meet another pride in the middle of this area. I'm hoping they're going to establish themselves here. It would be quite nice. 
and use this as the core of their territory and that will mean that we uh, we have a bit more lion action here which will be wonderful I'm being told that there are some buffalo at the dam cam so the dam cam is the situated at the Gari dam which is not far from our camp and as the crow flies from here probably about a mile and them buffalo would have made a very nice meal for these lions but shame the kudu sacrificed himself for them and as charlotte jackson says yes indeed they were looking very skinny yesterday now they are looking fat and happy to school week is now drawing to a close. Join James and Cedric for a fireside chat to take a look back at the highlights from a very special week. Sign up to be an explorer and you can join them as they take a look at how important it is to connect our future conservationists to the natural world. Wild Earth Kids, it's in your nature. So we've managed just to relocate and get a bit of a better look down on our three boys who are just looking out over their domain and with their excellent vision being able to see up to about five kilometers clearly and in high detail they'll be able to spot anything down in the reeds or anything moving about there so they're just resting here a little bit but we are sandwiched between two vehicles with guests that are on site at the moment. So if you may hear a little bit of chitter chatter, that's everybody just enjoying the sighting as well. And these cheetah are very comfortable with human presence. So it's not a problem at all. I'm sure they're just going to wait and see if they can... Uh, identify something that they may want to go down and hunt but for now they're just looking out and seeing if there's anything moving around it's a bit of a waiting game you've got to be patient if you're a predator
but they could still go for a number of days having eaten about three quarters of the kudu that they killed so these cheetah Kevin they have interacted with the lions um, the lions sort of picked up that they were around uh, when they went down towards the Bushman's River Basin and they, the lions very quickly obviously pursued them and probably wanted to kill them but these guys are used to lions and so they just sort of jogged in front of them and kept on just moving uh, far enough that the lions couldn't get them and it was almost like they were laughing at them because the lions kept chasing and the cheetah didn't even break a sweat they just jogged up in front of them eventually um, having pursued them for quite a while the lions got tired and uh, backed off and returned uh, back down to their cubs and the cheetah then left the area completely so they've now they're probably in the regions of about eight to ten kilometers away from the lions um, so it's not any problem for them now and uh, I'm sure at night they could have come across caracal jackals maybe even brown hyena so that's in the hours when we're not with them and when we don't know what's been going on the only way we would be able to know is if we put on a cheetah cam and followed them about um, at night but um, I think that's a little bit of their, their private time that uh, we can leave them but it would, it would be so interesting to know the kinds of interactions they do have with other predators when we're not around especially in the hours of darkness such elegant cats and I just I can't wait to see how they're gonna fill out in their bodies the shoulders getting bigger the necks getting larger um, and the kills of the animals that they're gonna be taking down so it's quite interesting because right next to us we have guests asking their guide questions about the cheetah and you guys on wild earth on the show asking me questions about these cheetahs so everybody's asking questions and we're trying our best to give uh, the answers that or you know from the experience and the knowledge that we have and uh, obviously we're just learning about them as well as we go along they were playing with each other a little bit earlier it was lovely to watch a real close bond between these three they really do not let each other out of sight very quick to contact call and come back together and you'll see a little bit of contact there now between those two very very close all three of them I think this bond is only going to get stronger and stronger as the days go by. tactile communication and uh, reaffirming the bond that they have so sky um, these three they 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 are a little bit older than Pumalela's cubs um, or well they're sub-adults now they're not cubs anymore well they'll always be cubs to Pumalela um, as any child of a mother will be her baby but um, these three obviously being males they're slightly bigger than those uh, sub-adults of Pumalela um, and the male, if we had to throw him in the mix here, it would be quite difficult for us to tell between them, but you'd probably see just that size difference. And with the male 
of of Pumalela's, he's still got a little bit of that mantle on the top of his shoulders. These three have almost lost it completely. There's not much of it left. That little bit of fluffiness um, right at the top of the shoulder blades on the neck area, on the top, uh, they it's almost completely gone with them. So that's probably the easiest way that we'd be able to tell between the two different sets of uh, seemingly sub-adult cheetah. These ones are just coming into adulthood, just starting to fill out, but they do still have a little bit of growing to do. Pumalela's cubs, they're, they're around 16 months, 17 months of age, and these around 19, 21 months. The one with the collar is a couple of months older than the other two, um, and so that one seems to be a little bit bigger and does have a little bit stronger mental capacity in terms of leading the chases and leading them and you always see it getting up first but then one of the two without the collar is quite a bit bigger than the other one in the neck um, areas and and often see it also um, going with the one with the collar so you see the one that comes to join now that one is slightly smaller than the other two. And here comes a bit of play. <laughs> and you can see quite a bit of that playful youth to them still. That might never leave them. But the older they get, the more serious they may become. not all about serious hunting and survival. So Alpes, um, I think the most known or the, the most amount of cubs that is known is seven or eight. But that's a massive amount for, and a big responsibility for the mother. Um, you know, cheetah move their cubs around a lot when they're born um, to try and uh, uh, sort of miss the other, the predators and so on. But every time she moves them, there's a big risk. She splits them up um, and she spends a lot of time picking one up and going to the others or to the new place where she's going to stash them. Um, and generally, even if she has eight cubs, if two survive, it's a lot. Um, even if one survives, it's, uh, it's a success. So if you see three, three surviving, four surviving, it's incredible. Um, but you can bank on, they normally come right with about between two and three. Uh, even if they have a large litter, uh, it's very difficult for cheetah to, to keep them all alive because they normally fall prey to, to other predators, hyenas, lions, and leopards. Here we have got our lions, they are back on the job feeding as I thought they would be. Young cub trying to fill up, trying to overcome his, his or her slightly mm, smaller than average stature for his age. I know how he feels, I mean I've, I was always smaller than average for my age too. I guess the big difference being that I never grew up. <laughs> may 
also be able to hear a lioness next to us having some sort of coughing fit. It's quite sweet actually. Let's have a look at them, Olaf. They were cuddling there for a second. Infinitely sweeter than watching the... Uh, what is that? That's the... Coccyx pelvis of the lion being, of the kudu being shredded. Yeah, you see they're having a little cuddle, which I think is always very nice. It's lovely to see lions have a little cuddle. See how fat they are? That the amount of meat in the belly of the little one will be doing an enormous amount of good, no doubt, for the skinniness that they were exhibiting yesterday. Very nice. All right, Olaf, let's go back to the main attraction, which of course is the recently eviscerated kudu. Poor thing. There we go. Now we can see the forelimb, I think it is, of the kudu going down the throat of the youngster. And then the two adults have managed to get hold of the pelvis. And I'm sure before long it will be extracted in its entirety. Now, although there's a lot of meat on this kudu, it's not that easy, I don't think, for the meat to be extracted from the carcass. You know, when we buy meat, uh, it's normally quite nicely packaged unless we hunt it. And if we hunt it and skin it ourselves, the butchering process is not particularly simple. Uh, we have knives, sharp knives and um, opposable thumbs and that sort of thing. And these lions don't. They've just got relatively, um, what shall we say, uh, agricultural tools for eating their meat and butchering their kudu. And so... You know, it's, there are nice bits of rump and muscle on the legs and that sort of stuff, but to get through all the skin and get to all the nice meat and all the meat between the ribs, for example, and the knuckles and that sort of stuff is really, it's quite a task. So I don't think it's a restful process for them eating. It's not like us sitting down for a meal at the end of a day and thinking, ah, oh, this is a good way to relax. I think it's quite a lot of work. Possibly one of the reasons they need to have such a long snooze afterwards. Sasha Atri, you're wondering if lions attack human villages in South Africa. Um, they do, from time to time. You know, a lot of our reserves have got people living on the outskirts thereof. And what happens is that sometimes the fences are broken down and sometimes the lions get out. Normally what they'll do, the lions, is go for cattle. They'll go for domestic stock. It doesn't happen a huge amount in South Africa and that's because most of our reserves are fenced. In fact, all of them are fenced. Some of the fences are dilapidated and there you do have a situation where lions can get out and they can cause damage to domestic livestock. Now, in most other parts of Africa, fencing is not a thing. And so the meeting place or the nexus between communities and conservation land is much more blurred. And often there's a sort of buffer area that acts as a uh, buffer, really, between people and wildlife. But frequently, lions will get into village areas uh, where we were working in the Masai Mara. The lions did used to get out of the reserve frequently and go and eat cattle or goats. And around Africa there are various kinds of um, compensation programs to make sure that people then don't take revenge on the lions. But it is a complicated situation and it really is not very fair on the local people to 
expect, expect them to have to live with lions that are raiding their livelihoods, really. But you don't hear a lot of reports of people being killed by lions in villages. That tends to be very rare indeed. Obviously it's a danger and obviously if you've got kids and they're walking to school every day and you live on the borders of the Maasai Mara, uh, you're going to be a little bit worried, no doubt, and concerned that your kids would be in danger if you knew that there were marauding lions around. But it's relatively infrequent that that happens. Much more frequent is the conflict between elephants and people. And they can be a danger to human beings because human beings try and chase them out of their villages and that can result in aggressive sort of um, retaliation from the elephants if you like. Kristen you're wondering about the kudu horns and how long it's going to take for them to, dis uh, to decompose. Well there are two parts to that horn. The first part is the uh, keratin sheath that you're looking at there and that's just like your fingernails or like rhino horn uh, and then the inside of it, unlike rhino horn, is bone. And the keratin sheath is actually very hardy, and that will probably last even longer than the bone. Until something like a keratophagous moth gets into it and eats it away, the keratin will last quite a while. Uh, I'd say at least a year, if nothing gets at it. But the bone, if it gets wet, will disintegrate in, I don't know, maybe couple of months it'll kind of disintegrate if it's wet enough and hot enough if it's completely dry and there's no moisture well that's what completely dry means isn't it James so if it's completely dry and it's kind of in the shade somewhere uh, you know the bones can last for years but if there's a lot of moisture you find these bones do disintegrate relatively quickly so a couple of months so in this particular area, this time of the year, if we get a bit more rain, yeah, I think that kudu horn's going to last about a year because I don't see the keratin sheath being um, threatened any time soon. So it would take the moth to eat it off before it would disintegrate fully, I think. Thank you, Rabbit Girl. You say I'm very dramatic and I bring everything alive. Well, Rabbit Girl, the one thing that I'm not bringing alive right now is that kudu. I, unfortunately, I think that kudu is beyond hope. I think it is highly likely that that kudu will not get up again to join his herd of females. I don't think he'll mate again. I think it's all over for him, no matter how dramatic I aim to be. They're all watching an electric land cruiser go past us. I tell you, electric safari vehicles, they are the way to go. Can't wait for us to be able to use those sorts of things. It's so nice and quiet. Hmm, some nice backlight there on that Leoness. Now those buffalo are still at the dam cam and Lisa is in Johannesburg and she's going to tell you about the buffalo at the dam cam. Sorry about that everybody, not sure what happened there. Obviously the dam cam thingy was not working. But now you're back with the lions. And this beautiful lioness is backlit by the soon to be setting sun. 
And frankly, where else would you want to be? Not sure why she left the kill, because she didn't do anything other than turn around and come back to it. So fat and satisfied, which was very nice for her. Right, here comes its cub, Olof. Let's get on that cub coming through the grasses. That's quite an attractive shot. There it comes to have yet another snack. You will there ask any things these their hips do not look good. I mean, that does not look like a cub in rude health. It definitely doesn't look like a year-old cub. Olaf said to me, how old are they? And I said to him yesterday, I thought the biggest ones were maybe eight months. I had no idea. Now you tell me they're a year old. Phew. <coughs> Phew. All right, Setters gave you Ntsumi. And now I believe that Sedas is going to give you another surprise. Yes, we just had a leopard now crossing on uh, Gary Main at Philemon's cut line on the southern side of Juma. It looked like Shadulu. Uh, I don't have visual of it now, but she just crossed over into another property called, uh, called Hoffman's. And unfortunately, we cannot, uh, we do not uh, drive in Hoffmans. It's not one of our traversing areas, but you can hear the impalas all snorting at the moment. I um, just want to see if I can get another view on it. I don't see much of them. Nothing. Dee -dee -dee -dee. All right, I might just go a little bit forward. I think we'll try to see what we can see from that side. Eh? Alright, let's just, just take a look. But uh, apparently, Shadulu did make a kill inside. You got it. Uh, you got it there, you got it there. Oh, there he is, well done. Well, a little bit more. Okay, I see. I think she's got the kill there. Let's see what she does with it. Okay, there. Alright, you can just see her ears flicking at the moment. So, as I said, we cannot go inside there. And she's busy plucking, looks like she's most probably plucking the fur off the kill. That's just by the gestures of her head, like, you know, going down. Oh, there she, yeah, you can see the red lipstick now as well. Oh, she's beautiful. So she's a very big female, Shadulu. And of course, if, you'd, well, if you were watching yesterday, there was a female called Kara. Now, Kara is the daughter of this female. Yeah, she's just busy plucking away there. And I'm hoping maybe she takes it up into this tree that's very close to us, yeah. Because if she doesn't do that, uh, hyenas will come and they'll steal the kill off from her. And that's not going to be a good thing. Well, then she'll lose a kill. But I'm sure she'll take that kill. She'll hoist it somewhere into a tree. But she's got cubs, she's got two cubs at the moment, and the two cubs that she's got at the moment is only around about three and a half weeks uh, old, so we haven't seen the cubs yet. Apparently the cubs are kept just inside of another property called uh, Arethusa Safari, and she's hidden her cubs around there. So I think what she's done, she's made this kill, uh, she ate a little bit, she stashed it in pretty much where she is now, and then she moved back to where her cubs were, let them suckle from her, and then of course she came back to the kill. So she won't bring those cubs yet to her kill. They only start feeding on solids after about six, seven weeks old, and those cubs are only about three and a half weeks old, so they're still very small. Can't wait to see them. I'm hoping that she's very successful on raising the cubs. Okay, there is another vehicle that's just come into, uh, come into the area now. So we're just going to see, oh, there she is. She's just getting up now. Come on, bring that kill ya. Hoist it into a tree, I'll be very happy. Okay. You can see she's very, sorry, there is a bit of a branch. Maybe I must reverse a bit. 
a little bit. Okay, I'm going to try and reverse a little bit. Sorry about this. So I'm going to see if I can... Uh, there. there we go. There we go. And this female's, uh, this female's one of the largest females I've seen around. I mean, I've seen many, many female leopards in my, in my career. And Shadulu to me is one of the largest females and uh, a good easy 40 kgs and maybe 45. And big girl, she's even got like a dewlap, like a male. <laughs> oh, but she's very much aware of things. You can see very, very nervous at the moment. Would you like a stay in the African bush? Open to all explorers. Sign up and stand a chance to win a three-night stay for two at the fantastic Mashatu Lodge in Botswana. This bucket list prize includes daily safari drives, traditional African cuisine, spacious luxury suites, and a promise of sheer relaxation. Sign up now and stand a chance to win. Right, uh, we're still here with uh, Shudulu, a beautiful female leopard that uh, looks like she made an impala kill. She's just busy feeding on the impala kill and just busy opening it up right now. But if you've just joined us on our sunset safari on Wild Earth, well, good afternoon everybody. It has been definitely an eventful afternoon on our sunset safari and um, I think we've had some amazing sightings. But first of all, my name is Cedric Dold. I am the naturalist here on us rusty this afternoon and my camera up uh, behind the camera is Muscles and Paul. So yes, thank you so much for joining us. Um, well, we've had a, as I say, a quite an eventful afternoon. And uh, Steve in Madikwe, he had a newborn zebra foal and the mother which was fantastic they got to see and witness the first few steps of that uh, zebra the baby zebra and james yeah in the uh, juma he had the telemati breakaways and the s8 male feeding on a kudu so they made a kudu kill this afternoon which is fantastic and of course myself i had Nsumi, uh, the female leopard and ribbon joining us as well and of course right now we've got to shoot this beautiful leopardess that's busy feeding on the 
Impala. Of course, down at Amakala, Ralph, he had the three cheetah amigos and Rexon had some elephants. So yes, if you've got any questions or comments or suggestions, as you can see, this is a live and interactive show, so please send them through to us. And I'm hoping that we can answer as many questions as possible and uh, we can then have a fantastic sunset safari with everybody. So here's another vehicle that's just passing us now. <clears throat> we will hear a few vehicles here. We are on a service road and uh, of course we can't go inside where Shudulu is because Shudulu is pretty much uh, inside of a property called Hoffman's, maybe about 30 meters inside, but we're definitely fortunate to at least get to see her. I'm hoping that she might tree drag this. The closest tree is very close to us now. Um, I'm thinking she might drag it and hoist it up into this marula tree for this afternoon. Shreya's definitely, I fully agree, I think she's had some, such bad luck with the cubs. I think, uh, I mean, she's only raised one cub to adulthood and that's Kara. Uh, she's lost so many cubs. Last year she lost her cubs, the year before. So yeah, unfortunately she has been very, very unsuccessful. Um, we don't know how, like maybe other male leopards, also hyenas. You know, there's, there's certain uh, ways of uh, losing cubs. But yeah, she's got two youngsters, three and a half weeks old, and I'm hoping that those the two cubs can get to adulthood. I'm definitely, I can't wait to see them. But yeah, she will feed on this. She'll most probably hoist this kill up into a tree. She'll eat as much as possible. Ten to one, she might end up going tonight, going back to her cubs. Um, that's in Arethusa at the moment. And let them go and suckle and nurse on her and then she might come back again to her kill. So that's one thing about a leopard is they are very fortunate that they can hoist their kills and keep it out of uh, out of the reach of uh, hyenas and even lions. But she's definitely enjoying that impala. Wow, we've been very lucky with leopards and lions this afternoon. Oh, Miyagi, that is very difficult to uh, say because what happens is if a leopard has cubs now, if a leopard has cubs now, for instance, has two cubs, like what uh, Shudulu's got now, and then all of a sudden you'll find that, uh, oh, sorry, there's another vehicle that's just, wow, there's some vehicles coming in the picture here now. Dee -dee -dee. So if she loses two, uh, two cubs now, she'll go into heat give and take maybe two weeks from now, three weeks from now, she'll go into heat. She'll mate again with a male, a dominant male in the area. 100, 100 day gestation period, she has cubs again. And all of a sudden, those cubs get killed by maybe hyenas or lions or maybe another leopard. What happens, she'll go into heat again in two, three weeks time. She'll go into heat, she'll mate with the, the dominant male again and 100 day gestation period and she has cubs again. So. You know, things can happen like that. Or, if those cubs grow up to become adults, like in Sumi that we had earlier, to about a year and a half, two years old, around about two years old, you'll find the female will start going into heat. So then, only every two years, she'll go into heat, if she keeps her cubs to that age, you know, to adulthood. But if not, it can happen quite often. So it's difficult to say how many cubs they're going to have in their life, uh, lifetime, and that it's just pretty much impossible to put a number on that. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, looks like she's just moved into a bad position, but we'll uh, stay and see if we're gonna be lucky. Maybe she might drag this kill closer to the road. Let's, uh, while we wait around here, let's head over to Gems. a horn as a pillow before but now you can see how it is done it's quite clever really i wonder if she will take this horn with her as a souvenir and uh, use it perhaps as a walking stick and as a pillow <laughs> now very exciting that you've seen shidulu 
especially as she has apparently, and I'm sure Cedric mentioned this, two cubs stashed very close to our boundary. And it will be very special to see some small Shadulu babies at some stage in the not too distant future. This is just ridiculous though. We've got a little cub having a scapula for pudding and his mother or aunt lying up against the horn. <laughs> I don't know if she's chosen to do that or if she's just happened to lie down and there it was and she doesn't really mind it being like that. I think it's rather amusing. It might just be me though. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure how comfortable that can be. Now, we were talking about how difficult it is to get meat the other day, and, or well, not the other day, about, <laughs> about half an hour ago, and you can see that that it's just not actually that simple. It doesn't exactly fall off the bone like a perfectly fried piece of steak. Hmm. I don't think it looks particularly delicious myself. I am partial to the odd bit of steak, medium rare, with some, just with salt and pepper delicious. This, however, does not make me long for one. Thankfully, no smell. The wind is blowing away from me. And thankfully, I don't think any of this has passed through these uh, animals yet. And so there's no scat lying about. Animal mama, a, a strange position or a good position for a nap? Yes, I think so. It's a little bit like uh, falling asleep at the dining room table in your plate. I suppose if nobody minds, then that's fine. Or falling asleep under the dining room table while everyone else is eating. Maybe you're having an enormous Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner and you know you've got to the end of the ham and turkey course and you actually don't think you can fit another morsel in, but you think you might. And so instead of taking yourself off to bed, you just lie down in your plate or lie down under the table and say to the others, call me when the pudding comes. I'll see if I feel like some. It's slightly less ridiculous now. There are one, two, three, four, five lions now lying around this carcass. Only two of them having a bit of a chew on it. The weather is starting to turn on us. I hope it's not going to rain. I don't think it is. You can hear the wind coming up. Possibly you can feel the odd spatter of rain on your face. Probably you can't because we haven't learned how to transmit that sort of information yet. I don't think it'll be too long until we do, though. So our guys have been playing and having an absolute jaw, as we'd say here in South Africa. They've been running through the reeds, chasing each other, tackling each other, and just having lots of fun. So the real sort of young side of them is coming out quite wonderfully. But now they're just resting up. they just looking around. As I say, it's not necessary for them to eat any time soon. If something just does jump out in front of them, they'll obviously opportunistically grab it and kill it. But um, with the amount they've eaten on that kudu, 
and it could be a few days before they necessarily need to eat. Um, but yeah, ever the opportunists, and they'll keep on walking around randomly, whatever jumps out. Um, typical cats, they will kill it. So they've moved down. We were sort of on the opposite side of this little valley. And uh, they've really just been exploring the side of the Northern Territories, or the part of the reserve that we're on. And I think they seem to like it here. I'm hoping that they make this part their home. It's nice and far away from the lions, and there's lots of food for them here. Lots of game. So, perfect spot for them. But that's going to be up to them where they decide to stick around. And also what they're going to specialize on when, uh, when they're going for kills. I think they should start going for black wildebeest. Because that is the perfect size for three male cheetah. And the black wildebeest also stay out in the open, um, but the early hours of the morning or late hours of the afternoon, only the best time for them to hunt when there's a little bit difficulty with the light, but the, the cheetah don't have a problem at all. So they're at an advantage during those periods of the day. And the wildebeest like to stay out in the open as well. So easy for them to take up that target of the black wildebeest. So for now, just relaxing up, but uh, as we know with Cheetah, they could get up at any moment and move, and we'll be here to move with them. So we just sit and wait until that happens. I don't think it will be long. The one with the collar does seem a little bit more edgy than the other two. It sort of gets a fright of noises and things that the other two don't seem to bother with. Maybe that's because he's a little bit older and uh, he's just learnt. So Martin, um, cheetah are the second most sociable animal behind lions. Lions being truly sociable um, with cheetah a sort of distant second. They, they, um, the males like to take up coalition, especially siblings, but um, there can be other different aged males, um, but normally similar age that can join in in a coalition. And uh, in record, we do know up to five male coalitions and uh, sticking together, very sociable within that bond. But it's only the males that do it. Females don't form co coalitions or prides like they would with lions. So not as sociable as lions, but um, between the males, they, they can be rather sociable. And we saw them a little bit earlier, lots of tactile communication. They, they do like to reaffirm that bond. There's lots of allo grooming, etc. Um, and there's lots of playing. So, yes, cheetah are sociable, but to a degree, not like lions with their forming big prides and they also have male coalitions, etc. But cheetah don't do that. It's just the males forming coalitions. So this one now with a collar, just walking up next to us. It might now walk down the fence line, which we are right next to. And this is another part of the reserve that uh, they have sort of seem to be enjoying walking along the fence line here and marking as well. They're not too far from where they made the kuru kill, um, which is now, there's still the whole neck and head left. All right, sounds like James has got excitement. Off you go. Look what's just arrived in the sighting. I think it's Marips. And he's, he can see the lions. There's no question he can't see the lions. And he's just sitting there. No, maybe he can't. Maybe there's grass. You know what he's done? He's followed the vultures in here. And he's still looking around. 
I can't believe he can't see the lions though, unless they're just below his eye line. I can't quite get an idea on him, but I think that's who it is. He's being an idiot. Because if these lions see him, they will chase him. Off he goes. <laughs> the lions have got no idea. <laughs> now I'm sorry for the angle that we're at. I just didn't want to move and disturb the situation. So that's why we've had to shoot over the back of the vehicle. All right, Olaf. Have you still got him there? Well done. I think let's... Let's see if we can't catch up with the leopard. How... <laughs> How astounding is that? He's just walking through here. Okay, I think let's I think let's follow the leopard. There he is. Thank you. Actually coming this way. I'm gonna wait here. Julie, you say, wow, third leopard on the drive. The difference between being that this one found us. Oh, he's coming up this termite mound, that's a good thing, because he's gonna see these lions. Olaf reckons one of the cubs may have spotted him, and I think Olaf could be right. Let's just watch what's going on here. I'm going to talk very quietly because I want him to be able to hear the lions feeding. Now, he'll be fine here. I don't want any of you to worry because he's very close to some tall trees. He is being a fool, though. Surely he must be able to hear them. There's crunching bones and licking blood. Yeah, he's coming up the termite mound now. That's it. Come up and look over the top, you imbecile. Please. Don't worry, everybody. I'm pretty sure that he's going to be safe. Morgan saying from the final control that I'm attracting predators just by sitting in one place. Well, I wish that were true, Morgan, but I'll take it for now. I don't want to move just yet. Yeah, the lion, one of the lions is now up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, the leopard's seen the, li the leopard has seen the lion. The lion has seen the leopard. Well, no, the, le the lion is suspicious. Sorry, let me get out of the way. The leopard is there, I can see the leopard quite clearly, and he's seen the lions. And he's frozen. Look at the rain falling now. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Now this lioness is suspicious. And the leopard's backing off down the termite mound. He's melted off down the back of the termite mound. So he hasn't had the need to climb up the tree. She's suspicious. She thinks something's up. And she's not going to see anything, I don't think, because Marib's has disappeared over the back of the termite mound as the rain starts. Wow, okay. Um, Olof, let's, let's go and find the, the leopard cat. You can zoom out. See, look, we'll just watch this cat. Can you see him? You've got him. Okay, there's the leopard. The lion's going in the wrong direction. The leopard's moving away now. You see, she's suspicious. She can smell something. <laughs> the leopard's going the opposite way from the lion. Wind's blowing, so she's going to blow away any scent. And one of the other lions is just going around the side to have a look. That's a, lion, a cub, though. Unbelievable. Hey? I think the leopard's safe now. We're just going to clean the lens. Sorry about that. Entirely necessary. Okay, let's move. I'm just going to... have to try and extract ourselves from here without causing too much consternation for the lions. Oh dear, classic. Hey, how amazing was that? 
Okay, we're gonna go after the leopard because we know these lions are going to be here. We know they're not going anywhere. Jeez, oh, I don't think I'm stuck on a log now. And you know, you want to know if I think he's cheeky like Wasana, who of course was his uncle. Uh, no, I don't, not, I don't think he's necessarily cheeky, uh, but he's certainly mischievous. And this is a trait common to many, many kinds of young male mammals. <laughs> okay, we're out. Yeah, these lions are smelling around this termite mound now. And the leopard, while we spent six days trying to turn around, has wandered off in this direction here. Unfortunately, I think we may have to stop and cover up for the rain. There he is. Please don't be an idiot. Go away. Don't stay here. Absolutely moronic leopard. This is not a smart plan on his part. All right, everybody, we're going to go up to Steve at Madikwe. I'm going to wait here and see what hap what's happening, but we do need to cover the vehicle up because it started to rain. Well, it seems like it's all kicking off again in Juma this evening. That place is just crazy. So we're just going to slow things down a little. We're going to do plant. How does that sound, everybody? Oh, I haven't done this plant before. It is a very interesting plant, but it's, it's gone all wilted now because of the sun. And the seed pods, I've got one over there on the car. I'm going to bring it a bit closer. But you can kind of see the shape of it. The leaves are these long, straight leaves kind of growing straight off of the stem. It's a forb. I break that off there. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, it's a milky latex. This plant here is called milkweed. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it there on the bonnet where you can see a little bit better. Okay, now when there's milky latex, everybody, you've got to be very careful about touching and ingesting. And this plant is poisonous and it can cause all sorts of cardiac issues in the body. And here is the milkweed. I'm just trying not to lose these seeds that I've got here. Here's the milkweed. And if I pull that off there, can you see that milky latex there, Rian? I wonder if you can zoom in on that. Okay, so milky latex, everyone. Always be very careful of milky latex. Now, the milkweed is apparently the plant that the monarch butterfly caterpillars feed on to give them their toxicity. That's why the monarch butterfly has got the aposmatic bright coloration to just say, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. Um, and that's because they get this from the, their cardiac, cardiac glycosides inside this plant. Uh, that could cause uh, poisonous, uh, cause, cause poisoning in humans as well as in animals, livestock. Now, these leaves have been smoked once dried to cure chest pains and colds. And you can also take them as a drink to cause your body to purge. So sort of an emetic uh, and mainly through the, the bowels. And that will lead to apparently some form of body strengthening. Okay, but when it comes to poisonous plants... Be very, very careful. Now these seed pods here are these beautiful little silky, comes out of this pod, which uh, when they hole, um, they've got a very interesting, another name that I'm not going to say now, but um, <laughs> you know, we'll leave it for another time when I find another one. So these seeds here, Janet, where does it grow best? Well, I haven't really seen it before coming to Medikwe, but seeing it here, we're finding it on these nice sandy soils, these sandy soils with a bit of clay. So, but we don't see them in large numbers. We basically see little bits here and there. Um, but it is regarded as a weed. So 
occurs all over the place, but I don't know its exact favored growth. But look how silky and filamentous these are. To actually drop the seeds on the, the bonnet here, these little black seeds here, no doubt when it's ready, which is what's happened now, I've seen a few over the last week or so that have been closed, and um, they look like a... <laughs> <laughs> they look like something quite obscene when they're large and these little hairs on them. Yes, yeah, so it's just raining by James. He'll be back with him shortly, so I'll bore you a little bit longer with some interesting facts about plants. But these little filamentous things here are very nice and fine, but the seed themselves is attached to it. And here's the seed. Let me try and get one. And when the wind blows, some nice distribution of the seeds. And these are good for using for tinder, for making a fire. So it sounds like James is back in the action. Let's send you back over to him. Now we haven't had to move. We just had to cover up the vehicle a bit. We've got, oh sorry, excuse me, I thought we were looking at the leopard. Let's go back to the leopard. And off, <laughs> I was trying to fix my monitor, which had ceased functioning. Anyway, there is the leopard. He has not moved. Uh, I don't know what his modus operandi is, why he thinks that being here next to the lion kill is a good idea. But the lions have not come over the termite mound to look for him. They've definitely smelt him there, but they haven't come to look for him. The male's head is up. We're not going to try and get a picture of him. I can just see him through the bushes, but I don't think he's got any idea what's going on here. I think he's just thinking about his next course. So I do apologize for the weather, which is uh, certainly not making things easy. I think it will probably stop in the next little while. I hope it will. <laughs> Olaf, are you alright there? <laughs> Olaf is now sort of hiding, trying to hide the camera and himself underneath the rain cover. I really do think that this is going to pass over very quickly and then it'll be dry again. It may get a little bit worse for a while and then it'll be fine. So, what a drive, hey? Three leopards. Lions, Maribs, approaching a lion sighting. I mean, all we need now is for the wild dogs to arrive. Possibly a couple of hyenas. Let us not also forget that we have had Ralph's cheetah up at Amakala, down at Amakala. He looks concerned or sort of dissatisfied almost, as if, you know, as if he's contemplating how he can outsmart the lions uh, and go and steal their food. I hope desperately that that's really not what he's contemplating. Shaggy dog, you say our spotted boy is no fool. I hope he's no fool. I desperately hope that that's true, Shaggy Dog. I think it probably is true, because I don't think you get to this kind of age as a leopard if you're an imbecile. I think it's difficult to survive as a leopard if you're a moron. Well, something will eventually flatten you like a pride of lions on the kill that you think you can steal from, for example. Unbelievable. He does have quite a distinctive look to him. I'm just helping this vehicle get in. Yingwe ikola. Yingwe ila. Yingwe. Tingala tile. Yingwe ila. Mila kubona yin. 
tingala tiko yingwa ila i'm just helping him get in young gen yes elizabeth i love lions too but they are dangerous absolutely especially if you're small and it's long ago now you voila he doesn't believe me that the leopard here he thinks i'm joking <laughs> he still doesn't believe me he's driven into the lion sighting must think i'm just sitting here for no real reason oh well his guests are looking very confused there's this strange man sitting in the middle of the road with an enormous viking on the back of his vehicle when a and a camera he's hiding under a hood and not looking towards where the obvious predators are <laughs> it must be it must be deeply confusing anyway as you can see that maripse has gone to sleep within sort of 25 meters or so of certain death really very strange choice to have made you know I, i'm all for coming to investigate as a youngster seeing what's going on but once you've done that and discovered certain death i'm not sure why you'd hang around jenna i id'd him using his 22 spot pattern and you've just asked how i id'd him besides using his spot pattern the answer is i can't i am so bad at identifying animals uh, and people actually uh, there is a part of your brain that's responsible for recognizing people and faces and that sort of thing and mine um, i think it's called the fusiform face region i think that's what it's called uh, mine is a i i don't think i have one and so i find it very tricky to recognize these cats some people will tell you that they can all sorts of markings on him but i'm afraid for me he does have a relatively distinctive face in some ways but i can't describe to you why it's distinctive he, his ears hang down at a slightly i suppose lower angle than some other leopards i know um does often stick his tongue out he's not doing that now but yeah i'm really the wrong person to ask about that i'm pretty sure the twitterverse will give you hundreds of different identifying features of this cat but the first thing i did was look for a spot pattern and for those of you who don't know what that is it's the spots above his whiskers two spots on each side he's a 2-2 male it's going to help them get into the sighting And he is I mean like you say he's smart I mean he he wouldn't have made it this far if he wasn't but I mean what is he doing Mm Thank you very much for that yes P Picky you say that he was already tossed up or chased up a a tree by the torchwood pride in a reserve called Biffles Hook which is not far from here uh, a couple of weeks ago so yeah you know, he's obviously likes the thrill he's obviously got a bit of an adrenaline junkie strange strange fellow to decide that such activities are a good idea anyway i'm very pleased he made it through as morgan says from the final control living life dangerously <laughs> yes that he is <laughs> a couple of you saying that the fluffy ears are an id for you uh, that's how you identify him james richard who can identify a leopard from just possibly a molecule 
of visible hair on any part of its body. He says he has a thick dark line on the side of his face that helps with IDing. If you say so, James. I mean, it's the kind of thing that I would be able to see if you pointed it out to me and then I'd immediately forget the next time I saw him. Lilipan, a tree nearby for safety. Uh, there was, he's now gone away from it, but there's a lot of bush around here for safety and he just duck into the bush. He'd be able to, you know, if he was aware, he'd be able to get into a tree pretty quickly and pretty easily. And I mean, there is a scraggly bush that he could go up to, into in an emergency. If we zoom out there, a little bit, Olaf, all the way if you can, and the dead tree behind him. Just keep going. There we go, yeah. So that's about 20 meters behind him, and he could go up there in an emergency and hang in one of the branches. I mean, the idiot has now gone to sleep. I know I keep casting aspersions on his intelligence, but good grief. Why take the risk? You know, you don't have to. You could just move on. Plenty of other parts of this reserve are stuffed full of things you could eat. But no, here he sits. James Richard is agreeing with me on this particular point. He says, for me, his face is just distinctive. Yep, I agree. His face is distinctive. But he always notices that he has a row of spots behind his left ear in the form of a vertical line. Phew. Well, well. So very good at identifying these animals compared with others. And, you know, no matter how I try, I am just dreadful at it. My wife's very good at it. She can have one look at a face and say, oh, well, that's who that is. Amu, you say you're impressed with my... To a Tsonga speaker, I still sound like a foreigner. It was always my goal to try and get to the stage that I could <laughs> fool a Tsonga speaker into believing that uh, I was almost a mother tongue speaker. But thank you. I do think it's quite important to learn local languages, or certainly parts of them, especially in South Africa, where we have nine official languages, believe it or not. And his name, Maritre, is a uh, Tonga name, and it's interesting watching people try and pronounce it when they see it written, because it's written M-A-R-I-B-Y-E. And that B-Y-E in Tsonga, unless somebody's told you this, you'd never know, but it's basically said B-Z-E, but the Z is very quiet. So it's Bze. See how he sat up there as I said it. Bze. Mari Bze. It's almost a whistle slash spit, but a soft one. Mari Bze. And there's a famous um, there's a famous camp and river in the Kruger Park, uh, where one of our leopards, uh, Temba, erstwhile er, erstwhile son of Kuchava, in fact still son of Kuchava, obviously, um, has ended up, and he's in an area that most people pronounce Biamiti, B Y I M I T I Biamiti. It's actually Bzamiti. It's a very interesting language, Tsonga. Now, there's a lioness behind us. I'm just going to have a look. She's walking towards the road, but away from Maribs. So I think all is okay.
Hello, my name is Melanie and I'm sitting in freezing cold Hobart, Tasmania, which is a small island off the coast of Australia. I became an explorer for Wild Earth quite a number of years ago when they first advertised the positions. I'm so excited about winning the Rock Fig um, Prize, uh, which will be in the big way, and I cannot wait to have that adventure. And I thank the organisers um, so much for this opportunity. Some of the lions have headed off down the road and others are still on the kill and Maribs is now just checking to see who's on the kill. In fact, you know what, I'm afraid I've got in his way. I'm going to reverse back. He needs, he can actually see the kill from where he is. I'm just going to go back a bit. Zoom out. So the kill's just there and his line of sight is through here. Olof, tell me when you can see him. And I'll stop. How's that? There we go. Yeah. Now if he looks up, he can still see the lions. I was just a bit concerned. I was hoping that we'd get them both in the same sighting, but I don't think we will. Phew, very exciting stuff. And you know, as soon as these other lions got up and walked off down the road, he sat up as if thinking, well, you know, I'd, while they're off having a drink, I'll go and take me some of that kudu. I hope he can count how many lions there are on the Talamati Pride. I hope he knows that the S8 male is with them, and that even if he does count one, two, three, and then one, two, three, four, five, there still could be a lot of danger lurking in the bushes nearby. But I'm not convinced leopards are able to count that well. Maybe they can. He's just fast asleep. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm distressed by the logic being brought to bear by this animal. There's another lion going off to have a drink. He'll come round the side here in about maybe 10 seconds. He's going to pop out just over there. There he comes. 
He's now jogging along the road, or jogging towards the road. The leopard is none the wiser. So we're quite close to a pan called Chela Pan, which is a natural pan that holds some particularly disgusting looking water. And I think that's where these guys are all going. One lioness and three or four of the youngsters. Covered in blood and gore. Fat belly wobbling from side to side, which I think is great. Poor little thing needed a good meal. I'm still not convinced that this other chap who's brought his guests in here believes that I've got a leopard sitting next to me. All right, we can go back to the leopard a lot. I'm like, what are you You call her. Yeah, I'm getting in on. James. 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 Hello. Hi. Yes. <laughs> A leopard. Gitchi Gumi. I've finally managed to convince this chap that there is a leopard here. Um, <laughs> you, you want to know uh, what the purpose of a leopard's dewlap is. For those of you who don't know, a leopard develops this flap of skin under the throat. I suppose in most human beings we'd consider a double chin and is not normally associated with rude health. But in a leopard, it's the opposite. It is considered a kind of sign of dominance almost, we think. I'm not sure anybody truly understands the purpose of the of the dewlap, but it could be that it's, um, you know, it, it kind of shows dominance and certainly the older a leopard gets, the more pronounced it gets. But some leopards don't really get big dewlaps, some do. And, you know, I do think that we try and find reasons for these things when sometimes there just aren't reasons for them. And little cubs coming running back this way. And calling, little lions calling, I think for the others. Marips has got his back completely turned to the cat, other cats. He's not interested in their calling. He doesn't care. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. I'm sure you can hear the get out of your way. Oh, we're coming back to me, are we? <laughs> we're going back to the leopard. There's the other vehicle. With their rather excited guests. That's Dennis, apparently. I'm sure you've heard that. Yes, Corky or Corgi, absolutely. Maripse is stressing me out. I think he's stressing everybody out. I don't like these situations. I think they're exciting to watch, but I really, if I was given the choice of Maripse away from the lions as opposed to near the lions, I would definitely take away with the lions away from the lions. Um, now he's watching the S8 male who's got up to come and have some of a meal. And that's got his attention. So I know you can't see it, but I can see that the big male has come to claim more of the kudu kakas. Now for those of you who want something slightly <laughs> slightly more light-hearted after the safari ends in about 35 minutes you can watch the wild show where I do some fairly irreverent sometimes sarcastic sometimes um, uh, ridiculous narration over some wildlife clips uh, we had great fun making it and it's not for everybody some people find narrating comedically over wildlife to be slightly offensive others 
have described it as a belly laugh. So give it a try, see what you think. Very different from the drives that we're having here. Right, so the young leopard is now watching a young lion who is interestingly roughly the same size, although younger, now walking through some bushes the other side of the vehicle. He's not coming towards the leopard. And you know, I don't mind this. I don't mind if the leopard has got his head up and he's looking around. That concerns me not. It's when he decides that he can just go to sleep there that I become extremely nervous. So he's just watching the big male. I don't necessarily want to move the vehicle. If I go back, I'll hide his face further. If I go forward, I'm going to block the leopard's view of the lions, and I don't want to do that. So I know this isn't the best picture, but I think this is the best we're going to have for now. I think this was a comment from Brodius. Maybe Marips has nerves of steel. You say you certainly don't. Uh, yeah, he must have nerves of steel. There are only two explanations for this. One is nerves of steel. One is a stupidity. And given that he survived this long, I don't think it's stupidity. Hmm. I think we've just stay where we are if that's all right everybody i mean i can go back to the lions if you want and we can watch the s8 male feeding but then i'm afraid i'm going to lose sight of this leopard and i think i mean you're welcome to vote as to whether or not you want me to stay here or go back to the lions but i know this isn't the best picture but i still think this is the best place for us to be Sorry, that last question came from, uh, uh, at least the comment came from Veridis. Veridis. Silly, silly kitty. Um, Olaf, do you want to go to infrared or are you happy? Yeah. All right, we're going to shift to infrared oh we don't have the light on we need to put the light on okay all right i think if we don't mind morgan won't you just link away and we can quickly shove the infrared light on because i would hate for this to be some action and i'd us not to be able to see it because we don't have the light on yet Uh, Morgan, did you copy that? Can we link to someone else while we try and put on the light? Would that be possible? Yes? No? Okay, we'll go to Seders, see what he's doing. We're just going to put the infrared light on here. And I must just uh, quickly say one thing. I said there were nine official languages in this country. There are, of course, 11. Thank you, Judy H. Uh, Olaf is now nodding at me. Thanks, Olaf. You could have told me earlier. Um, I was... a uh, thinking of our provinces, I think. Let's go to Cedric. All righty then, now I'm heading up Triple M North and I'm going on a very corrugated road and I'm hoping to head into Juma and to see if I can follow up on those uh, buffaloes that was at Gurry Dam, so I'm going to head into that direction. But yes, Marips has definitely got a heart of uh, steel to stay and hang around there while the lions are there as well. So only Marips, only Marips. Eh? 
Absolutely, he's such a, a, such a gem of a boy that I can imagine. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I have left uh, Shudulu that area. She has gone a little bit further into Hoffmans and she has left a kill there. Um, I wanted to stay a little bit longer that side, but it's very difficult. I mean, you never know when she's going to come back to that kill. And on top of that, uh, you know, uh, that kill's so open there. I think uh, hyenas come there now. They are just going to steal that kill from her. But yeah, I'm going to head and head to that side towards Gurry Dam and to see if I can follow up on some uh, buffaloes, some buffaloes, buffaloes. So, as the sun slowly starts heading towards the horizon, we have left the cheetah. Uh, they're in the area near to our house again. But um, we thought we'd just come and see if we can find anything else moving around. And we found these group of giraffe. A journey. And I'm not sure, I think this bull might be trying to make moves on the lady giraffe there but she doesn't seem too interested and the lovely light now it's just uh, beautiful especially with these silhouettes of these giraffe it's fabulous this one's got giraffes coming out of its eye the bull yeah, I'll take one left, yeah. I'll have a look with my binos Morgan telling me there's some drops coming out of its eye. That's done now. Hmm. I see that and it's almost like spider's webs as it goes away from it. Yeah. There you are. Look at that. I've never seen that. That's crazy. It's like it's crying. It's crying spider's webs. So obviously there's quite a bit of mucus coming out of the eye. Is it mucus or is it just uh, or is it coming it's coming out of its mouth. No, there's drops coming out of the eye. So drops coming out of the eye but it's also drooling. Yeah. It's drooling because of uh, it's smelling the female and there's a little baby and it's crying. Lots of emotion. Shame. Oh. That's very interesting. And now he's going to carry on pursuing the female. So the giraffe do like this area because there's a lot of sweet thorn um, and it's one of their favorite foods to feed on. So we often find them here. And this one just continuing on behind the female. Lovely yellow flowers with massive white thorns on the sweet thorn. They don't get very big, but they sort of, uh, they are bush encroaches as well if they're left unchecked. But the elephants also do push them down, they, they like to feed on them too, and uh, the giraffe do control them a little bit from the top. But they can help in re-establishing areas as well, which have been um, previously cleared for grazing on farms. And then you often have these sweet thorns coming up first. And with their thorny nature, it does, does sort of stop the animals from um, uh, taking them or, or killing them. So Greg, not particularly, um, the saliva, it's more they've got a lot of, you know, the skin around the face is extremely thick. So they don't seem to bother with the thorns at all. That drooling was more about him uh, sort of sniffing the female. Um, and then he's, 
yeah, he's sort of tasting it and drooling as a result. Um, so using the the vomero nasal organ, um, and then that that sort of makes him salivate. But the the eye drops. I'm not sure what that's all about. Maybe because they are feeding on these uh, sweet thorn. There's a lot of. They're all in flower now, and there's a lot of pollen. So it might be getting into the eyes, and maybe that's why it's making it uh, sort of leak and, and cry. We often find with the elephants as well, um, when they feed, where there's a lot of pollen, they get this white um, uh, discharge in the corner of the eye as well. And that's as a result of the pollen too. So I'm thinking that it's something similar, and with them feeding and on these sweet thorns and they're flowering now, I think it might be as a result of the pollen. He's still seeing his giraffe there. No. They seem to all have moved up to the left. That sun very quickly now heading towards the horizon. I think it's going to be dipping down in the next few minutes. It's incredible how quickly here in this part of the world the sun actually sets. In the northern hemisphere, I've sat and watched it in Britain and in Scandinavia. And it, uh, for me, I found that incredible how long it takes for the sun to set. For us here, when we go for sundowners, it's generally, you know, just for half an hour to an hour. Whereas there, you can enjoy it for two to three hours. It takes for the sun to go down sometimes. So, but with us here, it's a very quick one. So I think we may sit here and continue on watching this lovely scene as the sun sets. And it seems I'm not the only one with a lovely scene. The other one is James. Ralph, I'm not sure how lovely the scene is. It is still rather nerve-wracking. The lions are largely back on the kill. The big male is on the kill. He's shouting at the others. And there's a lioness behind us, eyeing Olaf. Don't worry, Olaf, I'm joking. He's not really eyeing you at all. But they're all kind of now relieving themselves in the patch of grass behind the kill. And Maripse, as you can see, is just looking around. A uh, few things to correct from my last segment. Uh, the, it's not the fusiform face region, it is the fusiform gyrus. That is the region of the brain that uh, allows you, and not me, to recognize people and faces. Thank you, Judy H., once again. <laughs> oh. I'm just going to help this person coming into the sighting. Station approaching the sighting on Pangolin Track. Maribs is off to the south and the lions are off to north. The affirmative. The people that are coming along this road, they find me parked in the middle of it with no apparent view of anything. Now, there's a lioness quite close by here, Olaf. Let's have a look at her. There she is. Now that light that we're shining is infrared, so it's totally invisible to their eyes. Now she's walking not towards Maripse. Maripse is off to the right-hand side of your picture. I think she's going to lie down on the road there. Oh dear, she's digging a hole like a house cat. This can only mean one thing. And I don't think it's going to be good for us, Olaf. You're about to have an experience, I suspect, that you will tell your grandchildren about. Let's see what she does. I can't see the leopard now because it's... Oh, I can. 
he's watching her. He can definitely see her. She can't see him, but he's hunkered down. I can just make him out, and only because I know where he is. I wonder if she's held off from relieving herself out of deference. Oh, thank you. There we go, that's a good idea. You have a little snooze there. Marips is now staring at her. Let's go back to him. I'll off if that's okay. He's now sort of looking, I think, with consternation on his face. Just zoom straight in there, his eyes are under that tree. Yes, quite. Viv, you make a very good point. He was bitten by a puff adder, a beastly snake, and uh, he then ate the puff adder. What's the pride of lions? Just shift the focus slightly back. I think it's on the tree. Out of way. There we go. You got it. So just to reiterate, for those of you who are new viewers, perhaps this is um, an infrared light, which means that it's not visible to mammals. Some birds could probably see it, but, uh, well, they'd probably more likely see ultraviolet, but infrared, very few, maybe a couple of insects, maybe a few birds, but uh, no mammal, as far as I'm aware, is able to see infrared. So this light is almost like no light for the cats and it means that we're able to view them without shining spotlights on them without affecting their behavior with artificial light that lioness is still fast asleep in front of us she's not doing anything and as you can hear some of the lions are on a kill on the kill now i have decided to stay where i am because the uh, incredible response I had on Twitter from three people was, stay here, don't move, let's keep watching the leopard so that we can keep an eye on him. Happy to do that. We had a really good time with the lions earlier. And so let's stay with Marie, one of our very favorite characters here at Wild Earth. <laughs> smelling, looking, listening, why is anyone's question? Why would he do this? There is no reason for him to be here. He's not going to get any of that food. He's so bored by the situation. He's now yawning. Oh, I can't believe this. He just doesn't give two hoots. to school week is now drawing to a close. Join James and Cedric for a fireside chat to take a look back at the highlights from a very special week. Sign up to be an explorer and you can join them as they take a look at how important it is to connect our future conservationists to the natural world. Wild Earth Kids, it's in your nature.
Yes, we just got a giant eagle owl here, just uh, landed on the top of this termite mound at Fulhamon's cut line. And I'm not going to go to speak too loud now, he's very nervous. I'll try to get him nicely in frame now, but uh, this is going to be the best we can get so far. This is one of the largest owl species that we do have around here in uh, Juma itself. And it is so, so pretty. Unfortunately, at this point of time, at night time, um, you cannot really see those pink eyelids, but they are absolutely beautiful uh, owls. I'm so, so happy. No, it's a rose eagle owl. That's uh, the new name, but uh, old name is uh, a giant eagle owl. And it's just sitting on top here. Oh, this turn about my now and again you'll see it's bobbing its head back and forth and just listening out for any rodents around here. So things like gerbils, mice, rats, anything that's going to be roaming around here in the grass areas, it'll pick up on very quickly and I'll try and swoop down and grab that rodent. But yeah, absolutely beautiful. And this is what I love about the night time. You get to see these nocturnal birds. Nocturnal animals. I hear it. It's making a noise there. It's like bobbing its head back and forth. Wow. That is absolutely amazing. Theo, yes, definitely. It is such a stunning bird. I am so happy. That's why I really try to sneak up as close as possible so we can at least get the infrared uh, light on this uh, Verose Eagle Owl. And uh, definitely fortunate that we can, that it didn't fly off again. So, yes. But it sounds like it's busy calling for maybe a, the partner. Let's listen out. I just want to see if we can pick up on that noise. No, I doubt it. We're going to get that noise. It sounds like a. <laughs> okay, I don't want to do it too loud just now. I'm going to bother the owl. Yeah, no, that, no, 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 that noise is too soft. That's, I thought we could, but unfortunately, it's a little bit tough. Oh, there it goes. What's it going to pick? Oh, it's not. Is it going to grab it? Uh, maybe a rodent? Maybe it's got something there. Let's take a look. It's busy moving in the grass now. You can just see the shadow moving around. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, he's moving a little bit further down. Maybe it'll come onto the road. I know if I do move forward, it is going to fly away, and I don't want that to happen. And they're very, very silent flyers, so you don't even hear them when they take off with those big wings and broad wings. You do not even hear them fly because on their feathers itself, the bobules will... Wait, it's got something. Did it get it? Oh, it's got something. What has it got? Well, something. <laughs> what? It's got it. What is it? Like a beetle. Look how it holds it with its talons. That is incredible. I don't know what's. It, I've got not a clue what it's eating. But it's very happy. It looks very delicious. Might have been a small mouse. Hmm? Could have been a small mouse, I think it grabbed there. Definitely it looked like something that had a little bit of fur on it. There it goes. Oh, what a sighting. Look at that. Beautiful. And how quickly did it pick up on that mouse there? Eh? So, so quick. All right, it is starting to rain quite a bit here. I'm just going to quickly put my cover on here. Yeah? 
This rain has been on and off the entire day, all the time, the entire evening. Look how far we are from that owl. So, well, I don't want to continue with the road. I don't want to go and chase it. It's the last thing I want to do. But <coughs> that was incredible. Nice to see that uh, uh, the rose eagle owl catching something like that. It's something that you don't see too often. And uh, definitely to witness that now was perfect. Is it still there? I think we must maybe try and turn around and try and grab another road. I don't want to bother the owl too much that side. I oh, know it's gone now. You can actually see it's gone now. I'm going to grab my light quickly. Yeah, it's gone. All right, we can actually continue with this one. So my whole idea was actually to follow up on uh, those buffaloes and see if we are going to be lucky for, with them around here. Oh, hi, Morgan. Go with that message. This ridiculous leopard came and sat on a branch next to us and then he went and lay next to the road and rolled about a bit and then he disappeared. And I'm not prepared to even think about shining a spotlight into the bush to see if we can see him. He's walked off in there, sort of away from the lions, sort of away from the lions, and I hope that he continues to go away from the lions. That's what's happening here. So we'll go back and have a last little look at the lions. I'm just watching this other game drive go down the road. Maybe they'll bump into Maribse. Uh, <laughs> uh, wow. I hope he hasn't gone in here and decided to try and circle round and get another angle on the lion pride. Let's go forward. Let's see if we can't get another view of the lions. I can put a little bit of light on here because I know the leopard is not going to be illuminated by it. He's in here somewhere. How wonderful to see a uh, Verroques eagle owl murder something. I mean, again, one must be thankful for the life of the poor thing that has been sacrificed, but really to see an owl hunting is very special indeed. Also to see a leopard surviving this interaction is very special indeed. Alrighty, why not to get ourselves stuck? Alright, you got a shot there, love? Should be good. Phew. You know, the feeling I get from, <laughs> from watching that sort of interaction is, I mean, it's halfway through watching a particularly well-done thriller and standing outside the headmaster's office, somewhere in between those two feelings. So now we've come back to the lions and we can see that big old S8 is actually, he's not being that nasty about it. He seems to be allowing some kind of co-feeding, but I suspect that's because he's full, A, and B, the kudu was slash is a large carcass and therefore there is space for everybody to lie on it and eat. I'm also relieved that everybody seems to be lying on it and that therefore there is not likely to be any lion lurking in the bushes for Maribse to disturb or kick by mistake as he wanders past carefree. Now he must have known this was here, so I think he followed the vultures here. He must have heard them feeding 
And because he's a young male mammal, and a young male leopard especially, he just decided he'd come and have a look. Adele, I, no, I don't think all cat species do have the same night vision. I suspect that cheetah's night vision is good, but probably not as good as cheetahs, at least as leopards or lions. I suspect leopards and lions have very similar night vision skills or abilities. But any cat that is active in the day is much more likely to have poorer night vision than a cat active at night. I'm just trying to think of any other diurnal cats other than cheetahs. Yeah, um, snow leopards. Snow leopards, I think, are active quite a lot during the day. Um, I'm not sure about pumas and mountain lions. I'm not sure about them. Jaguars are definitely active a lot in the day. But that's not to say that they wouldn't necessarily have eyes for the night. So, I, you know, in honesty, I don't know the answer to that question other than to say I suspect cheetahs don't see at night quite as well as these lions and leopards do but they do see at night much better than you and I would so in areas where there aren't lions and hyenas and leopards active at night cheetahs will hunt at night the, the, the daytime hunting strategy of theirs is to avoid competition with these guys I think you'll find that many, many mammals see better than us and other primates at night because they need their eyes for defense. And, you know, the antelope, for example, they're sitting ducks at night if they were saw like us, but they definitely see far better than we do. Probably, maybe not as well as the lions and leopards do, but they definitely see far better than we do. And that's why so many of them are that blue-green color blind. They don't see red. They sacrifice the use, or the, the they sacrifice having uh, lots of cones for color vision, for having lots of rods for night vision. Now, a really good adaptation would be the ability to see infrared. That would be a fantastic adaptation. Then you could have one of these torches and use it to go hunting. Yeah, Ray, wow, it has been a wonderful drive, hasn't it? That can't feel nice to have that male's claws embedded in your forehead while you're trying to have your pudding. I think that's unpleasant. <laughs> that's ridiculous. But Ray, yes, a suspenseful drive, absolutely. Huge suspense yesterday afternoon and today. We really got very lucky. Get your foot off her face, you nasty chap. Isn't that ridiculous? These claws are embedded in her skull. She doesn't seem to care. I mean, does he think he's being affectionate like that? He's literally got his claw embedded in the top of her head. That must be incredibly painful. I can barely look at it, actually. She doesn't care, she just carries on eating. Not even vaguely concerned. Absolutely unbelievable. Oh, that's really very unkind of him, I think. This child is now eating from under his elbow. Poor lioness, as Morgan says. Oh, now she's not moving. Now I think maybe she's decided having the spike in the top of her head is not very nice.
<laughs> but she's making no effort to get away from him. And now his child is licking his foot. I mean, only lions, only lions. Wow. All right, everybody, we're coming to the end of the Sunset Safari. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your questions and comments. Thank you to Ralph, all the way in Amakala, and Steve at Madikwa, and Sedders, and Rex, and everybody else involved. We'll see you tomorrow at 05.30. Bye-bye. <laughs>